Hey guys, welcome in. I decided to set the atmosphere by putting up a bunch of Halloween decorations. Ball, oh, I see you're wearing a witch's hat. Of course, Mason, you're not a wizard if you don't look the part. This is crossing dangerously close to the line of LARPing. If we start wearing costumes, I'm gonna stop showing up. Don't listen to Mason, Paul. I wanna wear costumes. You should have told me. I have some of those red devil pajamas. I don't know if that's quite in the Harry Potter spirit, Elvis. I mean, it was never explicitly said, Lowry, but death was a real-life person that handed out wands and magic capes. Mason, look at me. Look at my eyes. I'll fight you. I don't care if I win. I'll go outside and I'll fight you right now. Say my hat's lame. Your hat's lame, Paul. Shut up. Anyway, I hope you guys all had time to set up some spells for your characters, because it's all you've got all game. That and our tenacious personalities. And also Paul's stupid hat. Paul, do you want to at least look at these before we get started? Nah, Lowry, I trust you guys. A foolish move on your part. Yeah, a move almost as dumb as your hat. Let's sit down. I got some trouble, trouble, toil and trouble, all that stuff. Paul, are you okay? Yeah, this is all cool, but... No, it's not. But I think you might be developing forever GM syndrome. Where you run all the games and eventually you start to lose your grip on reality because you're playing so many different people all the time. Pretty soon you're writing music, drawing elaborate maps, and playing with several different groups of people so you can have them all interact simultaneously with different parts of your fictional setting. I've been there, Paul. You can ask for help. There's a light at the end of the tunnel. It's fine. Alright, so you guys are all first-year students at Dorp Toad School for Gods Among Mortals. A magical school where you learn the specific magical keywords that make normally inert objects fly around and stuff like that. And then you get graded on it. I got my spiral notebooks and my number two pencils. And glue sticks. Don't forget your glue sticks, Mason. Oh, you guys are still using glue sticks? See, my parents taught me the stick -a spell, which actually doesn't stick things together very well, but that's just as good as a glue stick. Well, a pleasure to meet you, my young peer. I am Mason Nostalgia Bottom from the proud Nostalgia Bottom family. Oh, yeah. I've heard of you. I heard your family was better back in the good old days. Yeah, we're on hard times right now. But one day we're gonna look back on all this and laugh. Oh, hey, are you guys doing introductions in here? Are we on the train? I assume we're on the train. Yes, you're on a magical train that's made entirely out of wood. Most wizards don't know what a train is. They think it's a type of snack eaten by mortals. But this particular vehicle was modeled by a wizard who saw something the mortals were doing, and he decided that he could do it better. As far as everyone else is concerned, it's basically a really big, long, inconvenient magical doorway that takes forever to get where it's going. The school uses it because they regard it as a great way to introduce kids to each other. And they gave us individual compartments and let us leave the doors closed. Am I barging in? Hey, you guys having a conversation in here? We're supposed to be making friends before school starts. Why, yes, new friend. Welcome to our private cabin. I can already tell that we're probably going to die together. My parents warned me not to join any suicide cults. Unfortunately, that does rule out every extracurricular group on campus, but I hate exercise and people, so it's okay. I'm Mason Nostalgia Bottom, of the famous Nostalgia Bottom family. We did a lot of great things back in the day, and I have no idea who this kid is, but he can magically glue construction paper together, which is pretty awesome. That is super cool. I'm Elvis Money Bottom. You probably haven't heard of me, but my family basically controls the entire world. I mean, not directly. We have boardrooms and stuff, and, like, politicians that do it all for us, but it is our money. Man, I remember when my family ruled the world. Well, I remember stories about it, anyway, on account of the fact that I'm, like, 12. Not that anyone asked, but my name is Lowry Waterbottom. I can speak to water. Oh, that's really lame. You shut up. I have the magic glue stick here. I have the power. Man, I wish I could do magic glue sticks. Well, I can teach you. Just flick the wand and say, Stickamus. 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 You guys are getting it everywhere. Stop. We're definitely going to be lifelong friends. I can feel it. Well, sit down in your glue. We got a long train ride ahead, and I think a lady's supposed to come by with an expensive cart full of treats. And it's going to set the tone for us living in a magical world full of wonder. So just be cool, stop sticking everything together, and wait for the wonder to roll in, okay? Mason, I can't believe that you don't appreciate the wonder of magical glue sticks. Next you'll tell me you don't care for magic markers. They're like regular markers, but they leave a more permanent stain on the wall, and they're summoned by magic. Sure enough, a woman rolls by with a cart full of magical treats and tricks. They sell trading cards, and each card has in it the trapped and tortured soul of a famous dead athlete. True collectibles. There's candies that'll explode in your mouth, and jelly beans that taste like real dog poop, but only occasionally. There's also chocolates in the shape of millipedes, and they writhe around and try to bite you, just like real millipedes would. 
You know, in the good old days, they teach you how to just outright turn millipedes into chocolate. You didn't have to buy them. Well, I have infinite money. And madam, I'd like to buy every horrific chocolate millipede that you have. Wonderful. Here you are, dear. She unloads a dozen boxes of squirming, horrific, chocolatey insects. Open a box. They scurry out of the box and scatter in all directions around the cabin. Whoops. Truly, we live in a magical world. The mortals must envy us. You got a chocolate millipede trying to climb in your ear. Do you... Do you want to eat that or can I? You can have it. So now there's chocolate and glue stick all over the cabin. It's pretty sticky, yeah. I'm trying to think of how else I could tap into my inner 12-year-old. Ma'am, I don't suppose you have any rotten crab apples for sale? Well, she says, I do have this box of bottomless rotten crab apples. Okay, I'll take that. Here you are. It produces one rotten crab apple every three hours. Thank you. Thank you. I guess, uh, I'll just sit here with my crab apple box amid my chocolate millipedes and glue. Are you going to do something with your crab apples, Mason? I don't know. I've never had so much power. Has any child truly been blessed with so much potential evil? Infinite money over here, Mr. Nostalgia Bottom. We've only just scratched the surface. The world will rue the day. This is good. I just need to process all this. Leave me to my thoughts and my squirming, gross living chocolates. You gaze out the window, the universe at your fingertips. Disgusting candy insects occasionally running across the glass in front of you. Soon you see the imposing silhouette of Dorp Toad School for Gods Among Mortals. The jagged spires puncture the clouds. Live obsidian gargoyles perch on the parapets, gazing balefully over the landscape. The moat surrounding the school is said to be the river Styx itself, having been portaled here as a defensive measure in times long forgotten. They say the ghosts of the dead still roam the school grounds as a result, but it's okay because they're whimsical and fun. It's gonna be a good school year. I can feel it. Oh, no wait, that's just another chocolate millipede. Hey, sales lady, do these things die on their own? They're made of chocolate. Everything they could possibly encounter in the bug world is going to be a predator. There's just so many of them. How are these made? Is there a factory? I think they come from the house of one charmingly obese wizard with a peculiar sense of humor. And there's no such thing as health inspectors. Well, they're definitely picking up a lot of lint. The train pulls into the station and everyone disembarks into a vast hallway. On a balcony, there's a giant puff of smoke and the sound of thunder. This must be none other than the legendary Headmaster Tumbledry. He's the oldest man you've ever seen, and his beard reaches down to his ankles. He's got a bit of trash stuck in it, and dirt around the bottom fringes. Greetings, students, he announces. Welcome to the Dorp Toad School for Gods Among Mortals. We're all in for a fantastic year of education and building friendships. But first, you must be divided into warring tribes, who will be pitted against each other at all times and in all things. You will never reconcile your differences with the other tribe. So go ahead and proceed down the hallway. The statue at the end will direct you either to the left or to the right. It makes the choice by looking deep into your soul and assessing what kind of person you are. Beware! One of the two sides is evil, but I'll never tell which. He winks and then he vanishes. Wow. That was the legendary Professor Dumbledry. I heard his brother married a goat. We could only hope to achieve such power in our lifetimes. The goat whispered ancient secrets of the old magics. If there was another one, they would surely be killed. I mean, I wouldn't kill it. Yeah, Mason, but you wouldn't think to marry it either, and that's why you'll never be a powerful wizard. It was so much easier to tell magic goats from regular ones back in the old days. Oh well, let's go be judged. You walk down the hallway and see a statue of a wizard pointing students left and right. It seems to be doing it evenly. First left, then right, then left, then right, and it's not even really looking. You're not sure if the statue is really peering into anyone's soul at all. Okay, guys, you're my new best friends forever. You remember the train? Those were good times. I've still got millipedes in my robe. That's good, Elvis. You're hilarious. Anyway, let's stagger ourselves so we all go to the same team. Okay. Paul, I guess we line up with students in between us so we all get waved to the right. You guys all get waved over to Team Red! Team Blue on the other side is composed of nothing but bad children, who all look suspiciously like you, you know, also children. But that's just a trick. Those children are evil. Come on, guys. Let's go sit down before these ugly blues stink up all the air. Red rocks! Blue sucks! Go, Reds! I'm gonna kill every last one of them. Dial it back a little bit, Lowry. We're the good guys. They're the ones plotting to kill us. I mean, I'll kill them all in self-defense. There you go. Kill them because you have to. Everyone enters the dining hall and you find your seats. 
Sitting far down the hall at the head of everything are the three other teachers in charge of every student here. First is Professor McDougall, a stern woman well known as the vice mage of the school. Second is Professor Fickletick, a wiry old man who teaches the art of potions, plants, and fauna. Finally is the dread lich known as Professor Skippy Bottom. No one knows the true age of Professor Skippy Bottom, but he's committed more atrocities in his lifetime than there are history books to account for them. For centuries, all wizardkind battled to end his terrible reign, but none were powerful enough to stop him. And eventually, all resistance folded up. After that, Skippy Bottom got bored and retired, so he teaches at the school now. Oh my god, that's so cool. What's he teach? Defense against the dark arts, magical history, necromancy, life magic, time manipulation, and forbidden seals. I hear the Forbidden Seals perform an amazing show on the weekends, where they jump right through a hoop in the darkest recesses of your mind, and then they eat a fish. Larry, are you talking about sea lions? I'm talking about seals. Lions don't live in the sea, Mason. Can you imagine how stupid? I'm gonna talk to him. Elvis, I don't know it's a good idea. Now don't talk me out of this, I have to do it. Paul, I walk right up to Professor Skippy Bottom. The dark, flickering embers in the recesses of his eye sockets practically pierce right through you. Drop a lot of cash on the table. Professor Skippy Bottom, I would like to be a lich. He waves his hand, causing your entire body to seize up in paralysis. You've been trapped in a powerful magic seal from which there is no escape. You're entirely numb, but you can perceive your surroundings in the passage of time. He flicks his wrist again, and you float up, then drift back to your space at the table. Well, Elvis, you tried. And luckily you lived. The young girl across the table butts in. You're lucky he wasn't banished to somewhere. Excuse me, who asked you? My name is Elpharopolis Montgomery. I'm from Kansas. And I know all there is to know about Professor Skippy Bottom. You're a liar. He's been around since before history books. I know everything that's important about him. What's his first name? Uh, that's not important. A young boy leans in and says, For real though, that guy gives me the creeps. I'm Donald Sneasley. My parents are divorced and my dad works for the government. Hi, Donald. My new favorite color is red. And this school was a whole lot cooler before I started talking to you. I'm Lowry Waterbottom. I talk to water. Finally, a kid with glasses breaks in. I don't think he's all that scary. He's just a skeleton. We all have that kind of power inside of us. Donald looks at this kid and he says, Wait a minute. Aren't you the boy who died? The table erupts out in hushed murmurs. You've all heard of the boy who died. Killed by the Dark Lord Huglack, he was one of the few victims willing to take the witness stand against him on the condition of being revived from death. Coming back to life is really expensive magic, so it was a really big deal. They put Huglack behind bars after that, but then he escaped, and they say he's now trying to restore his former power. Oh, yeah, I saw you in the wizard news. You looked a lot bigger in the pictures. Yeah, I was up on the podium, so I was at a high angle and I looked more dominant. You also looked fatter. An explosion in the center of the hall pulls everyone's attention as Professor Tumbledry once again appears in a blast of smoke. Greetings, students! Welcome to Dorp Toad School for Gods Among Mortals! I think I already said that. I'm Headmaster Tumbledry, and the boss of this school and all the people in it! And also, one of your teachers! But don't worry, just think of me like family. He winks. Anyway, I'm sure you're all familiar with Professor McDougal, Professor Fickletick, and Professor Skippy Bottom, or you will be at least. So that concludes orientation. We'd orient you better, but the school's layout is constantly changing and it is virtually impossible to get anywhere, so good luck! You're responsible for your own tardiness. All that said, let's get to the important thing. Normally, every year, we have some artifact or power or, or hidden danger that threatens the safety of all of you, and this year is no exception. He claps his hands together and a strange, angular door rises up from the ground. This year, we'll be hosting the Door of Infinite Consequences! Anyone who passes through this door shall be subjected to one consequence. What sort of consequence? Well, we can't predict for sure, but statistically most of them are fatal. He winks again. Normally we'd lock this thing up in a sort of fun, exciting puzzle room that you'd all enjoy, but I don't think any of you will be tempted to go through this door if we put it out of sight. So we're just going to leave it standing here in the middle of the dining hall. Watch where you're going. He bends down, producing chalk from his sleeve, then draws a circle around the door. All right, so the rule is, nobody crosses this chalk outline. It's not magical or anything. You can cross it. I'll just dock ten points from your team for doing it. And if you go through the door, you'll probably die. But hang on, I'm going to sweeten the pot. He pulls out a golden ring with a fiery glow about it and a deep green jewel. This is the ring of double power. 
There's only two in the whole known world, and whosoever possesses this ring will have their magical power doubled. Now, obviously, this would be most valuable to someone who's already powerful and terribly evil. But anyway, in it goes. He tosses the ring into the portal. Yeah, so you can just go in there, and who knows? Maybe you'll live, and you can have the ring. Anything's possible, right? Well, enjoy your lunches. Classes start after lunch. He claps his hands, and poof, reappears at his place at the faculty table. Then delicious food floats out into the room and sets itself down in front of you. Everyone gets to eat except for Elvis. A single tear rolls down my cheek, but freezes in place. Wow, this is really good. Magically cooked turkey. No matter what your tastes, it's exactly what you like. Oh, mine tastes just a little worse than I was hoping, which is exactly how Mom does it. So I'm really excited about this year's dangerous challenge. I bet nobody's going to go through that door, because all of us know better and would totally tell on each other if anyone tried anything. Robert says, I bet the consequences don't actually happen. Someone should go through that door and get the magic before someone evil does. Someone like who? Like Lord Huglack. The table gasps and Zelferpolis says, Don't you know you're not supposed to say his name? Robert replies, That's what they said before I testified, but the court required me to say his name. Why don't we say his name? Zelferpolis says, Because whenever someone says his name, he knows where you are. It's actually super annoying for him, and if you do it too much and he's not busy, he might kill you or something. Then, if we all started saying his name, it would just be a really confusing jumble for him, right? Society could actually crush one of his powers by just running their mouths all the time, which frankly is all people are good at anyway. No, see, it was a whole thing. His name is an alias, which originally only his most loyal subjects knew. But then they used the alias too much, and, and the magic was already cast, so it was too late, and it can't be undone. So if he hears his name, he can find you, and it's, it's well known that he might. I mean, I don't really care. Getting all of society to change their views on something is a really expensive marketing endeavor, and I'm only 12. You are surprisingly aware for a first-year student. Yeah, well, talking to water surprisingly does a lot for your sense of perspective. For example, did you know that water doesn't have an opinion on anything? It's amazing. You don't realize that everyone forms an opinion on something that they hear about, but water's just water. It really makes you realize your place in the universe. So, hey, I don't suppose you guys are incorrigible pranksters or anything. I heard that there's that type at this school. I bet they all got sent over to Blue Team, though. Robert says... All the evil pranksters definitely went over there. The pranksters on our side are just good-natured never-do-wells. We're hilarious and fun. But the blue team does their jokes to laugh at our expense, wickedly. Right, so we agree there's nothing wrong with torturing the blue team. So long as none of the teachers find out, it's allowed. Oh, okay. Wait. No, that makes sense to me. Lunch comes to an end, and Elvis is unfrozen. Oh god, I grab a turkey leg before it gets away. It's so good. It's just like how my goblin slaves do it. You have goblin slaves? Yeah, my family is so rich. We have so many slaves. Do you guys ever want to ride a centaur? I've got like three of those. Eh, sounds like it might be weird. Well, we make them wear blinders. You have about 15 minutes to get to class. However, the entire school is an ever-changing labyrinth, and navigating the mess will take at least that long, if not longer. Oh, it's no problem. My older brother taught me about that, and he taught me a navigation spell, so we can get anywhere we like in no time at all. Oh, okay. Oh, that's a, that's a, it's a good spell. I definitely would have overlooked that and not thought of it as useful. That's precisely why it's useful, because I knew I'd be the only one who had it. I can also juggle super well, and I can survive a fall from ten stories up. I also got this sweet wristband for my wand so nobody can knock it out of my hand. Rich kids get all the advantages. Okay, so hey, we have more time than everyone else. Several boxes of chocolate millipedes and a supposedly endless supply of rotten crab apples. Do you want to go to the blue dorms really quick? I don't know. If we did anything wrong, I feel like we'd have to tattle on us. Blue team is evil. And one of those kids I hate said it's fine so long as we don't get caught. Yeah, we're doing this for all the right reasons. We're in the clear, morally. Okay. I guess if we're in the moral clear. So, you guys make a quick detour to the blue dorms. Naturally, there's blue banners everywhere, paintings of famous blue team students, and all the bedsheets are blue. I assume you unleash the rest of your candy bugs and throw crab apples around. Yes, we do so, knowing that we are only hurting bad, evil children who would do the same to us if they had the idea first. Well, shortly after kicking all the boxes over and three crab apples in, the now familiar explosion of Professor Tumbledry bursts out of the center of the room. Oh, God! Oh, uh, oh, uh, oh, uh, oh, uh, uh, dang. 
We were caught. That means that we're the troublemakers. Sir, Mason and Lowry are trashing the blue dorms. And also I am too. I bought the millipedes. I was complicit, sir. Wow, you know what? You kids are my new favorite students. Plus 10 points to red team for each of you. Oh, but hey, a word to the wise? Next time you do something like this, I go for the kill. You don't want a blue team to be able to retaliate, do you? He winks at you. Wait, you you want us to prank them so hard that they die? I never said that. But hey, I'm also going to give you another 20 points for coming clean about this whole thing. Sometimes one of the hardest things you can do is tattle on both your friends and then yourself. Anyway, I have to go. Don't be late to class, you three. He poofs away. Well, now I don't know how to feel about this. They do say Tumble Dry is a genius. Maybe this is how his genius works. We got rewarded, but it felt kind of backhanded and like we messed up. I'm not sure if he meant the stuff he said. He told us to kill Blue Team. I'm sure he just meant it metaphorically. What would the metaphor be? Maybe he's saying, if we prank someone, they're going to prank us back. And the only way we could stop that is by killing them. So we just have to expect to get pranked back. Well, I mean, there's lots of ways that we could do a prank that would go wrong and kill someone. Okay, but that's not a prank. No one is laughing after that. At least not usually. You call that a failed prank, or a tragic accident, or a YouTube video. Truly, the man is a genius beyond our understanding. Anyway, we better go, or we're gonna be late. Away you go, through the many shifting halls, flying stairwells, and confusing doorways which lead nowhere. Thanks to your magical skill, you find yourselves promptly at the entrance to your first class, taught by none other than Professor Tumbledry himself. For the record, I regret nothing, but Paul, I just now remember you pitched this as everybody's Neville, so I think we're supposed to be passive and wait for problems to happen. Not really, Mason. I know I pitched it to you guys as playing the kids that tattle on everyone, but the way I see it, there's two types of character action. There's the reactive action that a lot of characters take when they want to perpetuate their problems forever. A good example would be comic book characters. They just sit around waiting for a villain to do something, and then they spring into action as a reaction. Paul, in fairness to superheroes, the kind of proof they'd gather from being proactive is not admissible to court. I know, Elvis, but the point is, if you wait for the villains, they always get to do their schemes, or they come close, and the hero never fully puts a stop to them because, for narrative reasons, the heroes are kinda lazy. The writers want the Joker to attack Batman for the next 100 years, and if Batman tried to stop the Joker before his evil began, it'd be a much different story where the Joker's actually kinda the underdog. That's called procedural crime, Paul. But procedural crime could still be reactive, Lowry, it depends on how you do it. The other type of character action is proactive, where the character sets themselves on an objective, and they carry on until they achieve that objective. In that case, the character sets the pace and the motion. They usually have something that sets them off, but for example, if one day Batman actually decided to hunt down and kill all the villains in the city before they could do more crimes, that'd be very proactive. And morally questionable, and not really in the spirit of Batman. And both of those things, but the point is, Batman would be the driving force of the story in a proactive situation. But in a reactive situation, the Joker is really driving the story. In our games, I usually trust you guys to be proactive, whether good or evil. That still doesn't say we're acting in the good faith of Nevilleness. I guess I'm just saying I'd be surprised if you guys weren't taking your own actions and creating your own conflicts. And whatever, I don't care. So long as you tattle on the other kids, we'll get where I want to go. So anyway, you were just about to enter your first class, taught by Professor Tumbledry. What do we learn from Tumbledry? Do we have a syllabus? You do. And next to his class is a picture of Tumbledry winking and saying, I'll never tell. Weird. Based on the syllabus, it sounds like we could skip this class. But then we'll miss out on the secret. It specifically says on the syllabus he'll never tell. So we should just not go. But maybe he will. That could just be a test. No, it's just marketing. He wants you to go to class so he has this big secret. But you know what secret it's going to be? We have to buy his book. That's always what it is. You sit through a speech and you too can be an amazing wizard. Buy my book. You know, I never thought of school that way before. But if you cut out a lot of steps, the heart of that is still in there. The books are expensive. I bet Tumble Dry's not even a good author. Regardless, it's on our schedule. And if we don't go to class, we have to tattle on ourselves for truancy. All right, fine. But if I didn't have friends like you guys, I'd skip class and smoke cigarettes. That's why you need us, Mason. 
you can't smoke cigarettes by the dumpster forever. Someday you'll have to get a job so you can afford those cigarettes. I could always bum cigarettes off people. I guess hustle them like that's a job. Whatever, let's go. You walk inside and find yourself in a fairly normal classroom populated by first-year students like yourself. Everyone quickly divides into red and blue sides of the room and then checks their pockets to make sure their wallets weren't stolen by the other side. I'm watching you, blues. Once everyone is seated, there's an explosion and a puff of smoke in the center of the room. But when the smoke clears, there's nobody there. Tumble Drive pops up from behind his desk. Ha ha! I fooled you! The first rule of magic is misdirection! Behold! He reaches behind a child's ear. A shilling! I stole that from your wallet while you were keeping an eye on your sworn enemies! There's a lot to learn from what I've just done, but they're not magical lessons, so let's not dwell on it for too long. Now, first thing I need you to do is pull out my textbooks that I asked you all to purchase, and then turn to page 243. You all do so, and all the pages are blank. I fooled you again! Or have I? Hold on to those books, for they may contain hidden secrets. But it wouldn't be a secret if I told you. I raise my hand. Yes, the bright boy there. What is it? Why wouldn't they be secrets if you told us, sir? Well, because then you'd know them. Sure, I'd know them, but not everyone would know. So long as at least one person is in the dark, it's still a secret from them. You know what, you're right. I like you. You're a good student. And the first volunteer for our actual magic lesson. Huzzah! Pa! Tumble Dry waves his hands and a bed of hot coals bursts up out of the floor, sending embers scattering in all directions. As a wizard, you'll be faced with all kinds of incredible challenges. You may have to drink from an evil seashell, or wear a necklace with your arch nemesis's soul trapped inside of it, or walk across a bed of hot coals because your teacher told you to and he's grading you. Get up, Money Bottom! Walk across those coals! I will give you any amount of money to not have to do that. Name your price, Tumble Dry. I enjoy your nonlinear approach to problems. That'll either serve you well or get you destroyed, and both ways get you into some kind of book or newspaper. But I refuse. I'm a man of principle. Now walk your 12-year-old feet across these coals. Okay, I get up and I cast a spell. Stretch physical! Then I stretch my arms up, grab a rafter, and swing over the coals. Tumble Dry regards this thoughtfully, stroking his beard. All right. Again, you've come up with an indirect approach to my problem. That's good. However, you weren't walking. I want to see you get through this problem by walking. I guess if I have to, sir. Levitato! Paul, I lift all the coals up with my levitation powers, and then I just walk underneath them. Well, Mr. Moneybottom, you've thwarted me again. Though once again not in the spirit of the request. Still, you do that three times and it becomes a storybook thing, and I'm not one to take the bow off of a story thing, so wrap it up. Take it, you win this round, Mr. Moneybottom. But I'll get you yet, though I hope I won't. Uh, does anyone have any questions? I, I raise my hand. Fool, it was a trick! With a wave of his wand, a geyser of water shoots down from the ceiling and into a bottomless hole. He grabs you with his magic and hurls you into the water. Now here's a real test! Most magic requires a wand and some magic words! Though if you get really good, you don't need either. You first years, of course, need both! So, what do you do if you're being magically drowned by one of your teachers, huh? Oh, well, I make rude gestures that tumble dry as I drown to death. Well, I love the spirit, Mr. Nostalgia Bottom, but that's not saving you. You'll have to really use your brain. Or something special with those fingers, I suppose. What do you think the answer is? Levitato! I grab a blue student and hurl him into Mason, knocking Mason out of the water. All right, you grab a surprised kid and sacrifice him for your friend. The new victim looks a bit bewildered and then starts choking. G <laughs> uh, well, uh well. It seems, Mason, that you've used the power of friendship, the most potent spell of all. And it doesn't even require a magic word. Well done. Thank you, sir. <coughs> I'm learning so much right now. Though I do have to wonder, Elvis, why sacrifice a blue student in the process? The blue student is still struggling to escape. Uh, well, sir, I figured any problem can also be a solution. Goodness. You're going places, Mr. Moneybottom. Though in this case, you're mistaken. He waves his wand and the water vanishes. The blue student drops to the floor. Where the heck were your friends? Go back to your seat. You'll have to think of another less murdery way to eliminate your competition, Elvis. But keep your eyes peeled. <laughs> yeah. Now, can I get a volunteer for my next lesson? All right, kill me.
I'm not going to kill you. Just teach you a valuable life lesson about thinking outside the box. And I may or may not punish you for getting the right answer. <laughs> life is random like that. Don't take it easy on me, coach. Hit me. I was born for this. All right, then. Get ready Let for- Levitato! Paul, I knocked the wand out of Tumble Dry's hand. Okay. He's surprised, so there goes his wand. Good heavens, Elvis. I like you. I really like you. Oh, I'm going to keep my eyes on you. You're going to be my star pupil. But did you account for this? He pulls two more wands out of his sleeves and wields one in either hand. Can you get them both, huh? Before I zap you? I'll try. Levitato! All right, that's two attacks in one turn, so you got a penalty. But that's a really good roll. So, both wands go flying in opposite directions. Excellent reflexes, Elvis. But what will you do about this? He rolls behind his desk, then yanks out a drawer, revealing an entire stockpile of magic wands. He pulls out two more. How many times can you take them away, huh? I can do this all day. Knock over my desk. Levitato! I hurl his entire desk through the window, then I duck behind my desk. Snapshot. Penalty. But the roll's good. You now have cover. The desk crashes through the ancient windows of the school, sending wands scattering in all directions on its way out. It'll land somewhere in the courtyard, and good luck to anyone down there. Throwing around a lot of magic, aren't you, Elvis? You must be getting pretty tired. <sighs> uh, yep, but all you've got now is two wines. That was pretty quick thinking. Couldn't beat me in attrition, so you threw out the whole stockpile. Smart. Smart. Never attack a stronger opponent head on. All I gotta do is get those two you have left, sir. And you can't disarm me, because my wand has a wrist strap. You know, I kick myself for not thinking of the same thing. Ah, the money I would have saved, and I thought I was smart. Uh, but guess what? Levitato! Elvis, he slides away your desk, then physically grabs you and hurls you out the broken window. Ah, the cover did nothing! I can just throw the whole baby out with the bathwater! Levitato, I catch Elvis. You grab him. Oh, thank goodness. Once again, the power of friendship prevails, but this time to reward your previous good deeds, Mr. Elvis. I dare say you barely need the assistance of derp toads. Which is why you're going to do so well here, and why I'm going to focus just so many resources on you. Uh, but anyway, we've still got tons more class to do, so moving on. Uh, sir, I wanted to say something. Go ahead, Mason. Ultimate Nostalgia Bottom Family Attack. Things were better when they used to be good. Nova Cannon Configuration Mark III. <laughs> that, that is a lot of dice. What are you doing? Okay, Mental Illusions. He goes back to his fondest memory and relives his entire life from that point onward until either he dies or snaps out of it. <laughs> okay. Wow, that is... that's an 82. It's the only spell I know. So what are you, like Gilderoy Lockhart? No. Who was that? Oh, the memory guy. Yeah, the guy who erased everyone's memories and then took credit for their stuff. Oh, uh, yeah. Paul. Oh, uh, that guy. Okay, in this game system... This, that's how the game system would have it. That guy was very good at only the one spell, and you know why? It costs all your character points. This is an expensive power. Okay, so Mason, just to reiterate, assuming you got past all of Tumble Dry's passive magical defenses just now, he's reliving his entire life from his happiest memory onward. I mean, if he has passive mental defenses, that's kind of a fly in the ointment, but otherwise, yeah. All right. He approaches a hat rack in the corner of his office. Oh... Betty Nostalgia Bottom fancy running into you here. <laughs> I know, I know, I invited you. Wait a minute. Well, I just wanted to say, you know, I've always fancied you. Tumble Dry, no, that's my grand-grand. You can't love her, she's old. Oh, you feel the same way? Thank heavens. Oh, you made me so happy, I just... Oh, come here, you. He starts passionately making out with the hat rack. Uh, 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 oh. Mason, your grand-grand dated Tumble Dry? I guess... Well, there's no levitatoing out of this. He just keeps going. You're not sure if it's going to stop. You're pretty sure he goosed the hat rack's backside. Uh, uh, How long is this going to last? Uh, I, I mean, if he doesn't get over it within about a minute, then give him 15. And if not by then, tomorrow. And if not tomorrow, next year. Failing that, basically forever. Well, then I guess we'll just wait him out. All right. The class waits out Tumble Dry's makeout session, which carries on graphically and disgustingly for pretty much the rest of class. Eventually, the kids work up the confidence to start talking amongst themselves, and several of the red team approach you guys over your amazing performance. 
I think it was pretty awesome how you threw that desk out the window. Thanks. I do it all the time at home. Uh, excuse me, I'm the one who got tumble dry to start making out with the hat rack? At last, the giant musical bells start clanging, signaling the end of class. Whoops, looks like we're all out of time. Your homework is to get into one fight and actually win it. Knock it out. Me and Mrs. Nostalgia Bottom need some privacy. Wait. So wait. Did my spell not even work? Did I not just tell you I need privacy, Mason? Get out of here! Truly, the legend of this man's genius is completely understated. If you can call it genius, what did he have to gain? He certainly defeated you completely. I, I mean, uh, uh, whose class is next? It appears Professor McDougal teaches your next class. I feel ready for her. I feel ready for anything. Let's go throw her through a window! <sighs> uh, well, I guess I don't have any diversionary plans this time, so let's go straight to class. Wait, I have to go to the bathroom. Okay, first the bathroom, then war! You find one of the bathrooms. There's an undead ghoul just hanging around eating half a dead rat. It doesn't seem to pay you much attention, Lowry. I'm sure this is normal and everything's fine. I go about my business, wash my hands. Keep on keeping on, ghoul. Go outside. Hey, are you guys starting to wonder if maybe Dorp Toads kind of sucks? I'm really enjoying it so far. I feel like this is really my element. Well, sure, as one of the few kids who received any amount of positive attention, I guess it's fine. But there's a flesh-eating undead in the bathroom, and I feel like that's a real time bomb. I'm sure it's not that bad. He's probably a janitor or something. Mason, his rotting flesh definitely smells worse than anything else in the bathroom. And that's what I thought at first, too. But in the clarity of an empty bladder, I realize there's no functional reason to have a ghoul in the bathroom. If it were a problem, someone would put up a sign. Maybe we're supposed to put up the sign. We can't do that. We don't have the authority. I don't know. It seems like maybe Tumble Dry is testing us again. See, you think you have the right answer by staying inside the lines when you're actually supposed to be making everything up according to your feelings and personal biases. My personal feeling is that it's not our job to warn the other students about a ghoul in the bathroom if the faculty won't bother to take those steps themselves. Besides, it'll be funny. I mean, it just takes us a second. Paul, I produce a magic marker and write, Beware of ghoul on the bathroom door. Just as you finish doing so, there's an explosion and Tumble Dry is standing behind you. Oh, it's you guys again. Hey, did you know that people have been ignoring that ghoul in there for almost an entire generation of students? It's eaten six kids. You're the first ones to finally put up a warning for everyone. 50 points for Red Team! There's another explosion and he's gone. You see, I think I got Tumble Dry all figured out. I guess I got lucky. Or the ghoul just isn't a very active hunter. It would have literally had me with my pants down. Well, let's get to class before we run into another test. It's not that I don't like our string of success, but we only have to fail one time before it becomes a real problem, and I don't see reason to push our luck. Okay, I lead on. Through twists and turns, floating staircases, paintings that are actually doors, doors that are actually paintings, and one detour because they're repaving a section of the building, you arrive at McDougal's classroom long before most other students. All right, Paul, what's the syllabus say that this one's about? Practical basics and spellcraft. Oh, then we got that after the walk on the hot coals? At least now we know what kind of things we're going to apply the basics to. In we go. I'm ready. I can take it. You walk into a nearly empty classroom to find Professor McDougal tidying up and preparing. Ah, looks like the bottom trio is first before the bell. Ma'am, could you please never call us that again? We prefer to be called the Ultra Bottom Squad. I'm Money Bottom! Strike a dramatic pose. And I'm Water Bottom. Strike a mirror pose to Elvis. I talk to water. Uh, and I'm Nostalgia Bottom. Reluctantly strike the pose. Come on, Mason, up your game. My, how very creative. Thanks. You wouldn't believe how long it took us to come up with that. Didn't we just meet today? Seconds. It took us mere seconds. Oh, yeah. Well, though, in fairness, Elvis, we're just copying popular Japanese media. So I wouldn't say it's fair to call us creative. Man, I'm a downer today. Well, there's no such thing as anything truly original. Everything is copying popular Japanese media. That's not true. What about... Egypt. They copied Yu-Gi-Oh! Egypt predates Yu-Gi-Oh! Elvis. I think it's really more of a chicken and the egg type of thing, Mason. Actually, we were going to learn today that Japan is really the source of magic and life on Earth, but it's kind of a crazy supernatural time loop sort of thing, so it hasn't happened yet. See, Mason, if you just read the textbook before class, you could avoid looking stupid like this. Man, well, you know what? Things are gonna be better for me in the future. Which is actually the past, apparently, just quite a long ways off. More students begin to stream in at the last minute. McDougal says, take your seats, everyone. Everybody gets situated and she picks up her notebook, opens to the first page, and then frowns. Oh. She walks over to a pile of crates and pulls away a tarp. 
revealing a cage full of half-lizard, half-bird creatures with bags over their heads. Oh, I see. Well, students, we were going to cover a brief history of magic and learn some basic spell composition, but it looks like Professor Tumble Dry has decided to include a bit of an extra, and, you know, he makes the rules. I'm surprised we didn't hear those things. Yes, well, they've been made magically silent. Here, pass a cockatrice around to the left until everyone has one or there's no more left to pass around. And the students begin passing around these animals, which actually are scratching, thrashing, and trying to escape. Miss McDougal, is there a way we're supposed to hold these, or...? Just try to keep the claws away from you. Now, every problem in life has one single esoteric spell that will solve that problem outright. But it will only solve that one particular problem. Oh, I know the one. Levitato! I launch my cockatrice out the window. Crash! You obliterate another window, and the cockatrice with it. Successfully defeating the creature. I suppose there are alternative methods for dealing with any given problem, if you feel confident. However, if this were a test, I'd just give you an F, Mr. Elvis. Oh, but I beat the cockatrice. But did that spell require you to have eye contact on the animal? I mean, yeah, but I could also levitate all kinds of things. Like a metric ton of dirt, I could just bury stuff. Well, the creative use of levitato is not the point of this lesson. We're going to learn the phrase that defeats all cockatrices, but specifically only cockatrices. That way you can defeat a cockatrice even if you forget the phrase for levitato. Well, I use levitato all the time, so I, I'm probably not ever going to forget it. That's it, I'm deducting three points from red team. Ah. Don't complain or it'll be three more. This is a classroom. You do as you're told and we'll all survive. Now, the important thing here is that the cockatrice does not make eye contact with you, or else you'll be frozen into stone. A student in the back appears to be having some trouble with his animal. It gets a claw underneath the hood, and- Pulvis. All right, pulvis. Lowry, what does that do? It causes all the dust in the room to go poof, rise up in the air, and then fly directly into everyone's eyes. Including yours? Um... You know what? I didn't think about that when I designed the spell, so it looks like we all suffer. All right, everyone screams. Ah! Ah! Lowry! I saved your life. Shut up. A little warning next time, Mr. Lowry. You're all just a bunch of ingrates. How long is everyone blind? Uh, looks like about a minute. It burns! When I can okay, see again, just, I'm going to dump the whole pencil sharpener closed. in your face, I, Lowry. All right, I'm going to cover my eyes without your simmer dang down. assault. Please, simmer down. Okay. So the spell to defeat a cockatrice is cockatruckle. And you all hear the sound of some kind of magic. It sounds like someone tossed a gyro into a large triangle. A brrrp bang. You may have dropped your bird in the confusion, but if not, you feel it go limp in your hands. Okay, calm down. All the animals should be subdued, but keep your eyes shielded. They are still dangerous. Please do your best to find the wall, then follow it to the exit. And everyone kind of stumbles and shuffles their way out. Professor? Is it true that the founder of the school enchanted a giant cockatrice to live in the walls and kill mixed-race kids? Uh, well, we don't like to talk about some of the more dated worldviews of our founders. But yes, there is an ancient immortal wild cockatrice that specifically commits hate crimes. And it lives in the school. But we've been keeping it mostly subdued during the school year. So, we don't need any more letters from your parents. I heard there's a secret word that makes knives fly out of the walls and stab you to death. Ah, uh, Yes, that's unrelated, but one of our professors was a bit of a prankster. Uh, we're not going to divulge what that word is, so just rest assured you wouldn't use it in a normal conversation. Is it divulge? No, Mason, I just used that word, and if it were the word, I would have been stabbed to death. Well, it just seemed like a weird word. Like, I feel like I don't hear that word very All often. All right, I need to concentrate. There are several spells that could be used to resolve this problem, she looks around. I don't suppose everyone grabbed their things. Isn't there a specific spell that just makes them all go away? There is, but I can't remember it off the top of my head. You know, this is supposed to be Skippy Bottom's thing, but I know that he'd never take this sitting down. And I shouldn't either. I have half a mind. As soon as the headmaster isn't busy with more important matters, I'll have a word with him. But for now, um, I suppose I'll just... <laughs> she opens the door a crack. Micro wave em. Then she shuts the door. So we'll just let that sit for about four minutes, and then I suppose we'll, we'll let it cool down for another ten or fifteen. One of us could have levitated our book bag and checked to see what spell makes cockatrices go away. I wish you'd suggested that earlier. You hear some popping sounds behind the door. 
It's all right. I know a spell to get blood and viscera out of garments, books, walls, you name it. I've worked with Headmaster Tumbledry a, a long time. Everyone stands around for a while in awkward silence. Is the word peanut? No, it's something you'd never use in a normal conversation. What about thermometer? You know what? Let's try and learn what we can without my notes. And she does her best to deliver a partial lecture, but as it turns out, she's not very good without her notes to get by, and it's kind of a mess. Eventually, the bells ring again. Professor McDougal sneaks inside the classroom to supposedly clean your stuff. And it's time to set off for class with Professor Fickletick. Paul, how come Professor McDougal couldn't recite her lessons by heart? Shouldn't she have done this class like a million times? I, uh, it seemed more character defining for her to need her notes. Well, the point of structure like that is to be resilient. I know, Elvis. I guess I was also thinking about how in Hogwarts they keep shuffling the teachers around because the dark arts teacher always dies. That doesn't happen here at Derp Toads, but I, I didn't slow down to pull that apart. See, Paul, this is why you need to take your prep time seriously. You should have known we'd ask these questions. Mason, I never have any idea what questions you're going to ask. I'm making 90% of this up as I go. My session notes are a paragraph long. If anything, that's too many, Paul. Every bullet point on your list is a potential point for your plans to fail. Well, it's working so far, Lowry. Partly because I don't have very many plans, and partly because you're being herded to your next class before the bell. We could play hooky. No, you're the tattletale kids, remember? You have to tell the teachers if you break the rules. Ah, oh, dang it. That's insidious, Paul. I've got you trapped within the character concept. Well, on we march to our next thing. I think it's Professor Fickletick. Man, I want to see Skippy Bottom. Why do they hold the best class for last? By the time we get there, I'm going to be all sleepy and tired. Seems like classes start in the afternoon. I want to say from like 1 to 5 p.m. Honestly, it's shorter than a school day in most countries. There's very little practical stuff to learn about magic. Just memorize words on a flashcard, and then there's maybe potions. But that might only be memorizing a list of ingredients. Speaking of potions, the next class is indeed with Professor Fickletick, who's in charge of botany and potions. You'll grow your own ingredients, then mix them together afterward. See? Magical gardening. This is where it all comes together. We all learn this, some of us go on to battle the Dark Lord, and the rest of us magically grow potatoes forever. Not me! I got money! And slaves! That just means you become the Dark Lord. And whether you get the title officially falls to whether or not you murder someone in public view. Nah, Dark Lords sometimes come from poverty. Oh sure, you can pull yourself up by the bootstraps and become the scourge of the universe just through serial murder and racism. But let's be honest, it helps to have friends in high places and income to pay your armies. We can't all just be evil minions as a hobby, Paul. Some of us have jobs, or go to school. Yeah, logically anyone who tried to rule by fear alone would just be murdered by his inner circle eventually. Most evil dictators rise to the top by exploiting holes in the system. Then the whole system winds up backing them. Paul, was Lord Huglack rich or in politics? Uh, yes. And he did all the stuff you guys just said on top of all the lawless killings. Oh, well, then it sounds like our wizard society is probably on the verge of collapse anyway. It's probably not good the Dark Lord was a magical senator, or whatever. I don't know if we even get to vote. But I'm mad enough to be radicalized about this whole thing, and I'm going to join a militia group that wants to stop it. But a radical militia group for good guys. Yes, that's a later book, though. Uh, anyway, you arrive at Professor Fickletick's classroom, which is actually outside in a huge, beautiful greenhouse stuffed with exotic plants and flowers. The greenery has taken over both the inside and the outside. When a pigeon is dumb enough to land on the roof, some form of greenery grabs it. Life is so beautiful. You know, catfish in the city rivers will do that same thing. A pigeon's life is simple, yet terrifying. There's also a tree planted nearby. They call it a child-killing tree. If you walk anywhere close to it, it'll swing its mighty branches down and crush you to a paste. No one knows why the tree does this or what it has to gain, but being that they're magical and bloom with gorgeous flowers in the spring, they really bring up the property value, so the school has planted several child-killers around the grounds. There's no fences keeping you away, so you're expected to recognize them when you see them. Oh, my aunt has a garden full of these. We haven't seen her in two years, and we're pretty sure she's dead. The tree occasionally flicks its branches, swatting bugs. A pigeon lands on it, and it detonates as the wooden appendages collide. Wait, if it kills everything that gets close to it, how does it pollinate? Nobody knows. No one can get close enough to find out. No, that's stupid. I refuse to accept that. We all have this magical power at our disposal, and we can't find out where babies come from. Mason, does your mind power work on plants? 
No, you have to specify what types of minds these powers work on. And I chose people, for obvious reasons. Darn it. You win this round, child killing tree, but this isn't over. I'm gonna find out how you do sex with other trees. Man has a right to know. Anyway, let's go to class. You head inside and find the smiling, diminutive figure of Fickletick sitting expectantly behind his desk. Your own desks are occupying a tile section of the floor, but you're being crowded by garden tools. Come in, come in. Have a seat. We're just waiting for the other children, he says. The other kids arrive and fill out their seats. The bells ring to signal class has begun, but Fickletick stays seated. We'll just give it five minutes for any stragglers. Don't want anyone to miss out, you know? Five minutes tick away in awkward silence. Fickletick seems quite pleased the entire time. Finally, he gets up and he says, Well, I suppose that is everyone. Let's get started. I'm going to teach you all about the wonderful worlds of plants and potions, and we're going to start by growing our own ingredients. First, you'll need a flower pot. He grabs one flower pot, picks it up, and hands it to Mason. There you are. Now go ahead and pass that to the back of the class. Okay, I do so. He watches the pot go all the way back, then goes and fetches a new one and hands it to you again. Okay, I guess that one goes back too. And on it goes, slowly but surely until everyone has a flower pot. There we are. Now does everyone have a pot? You'll need it for the next step. I raise my hand. Yes, Elvis Moneybottom. I need a pot. I see you have one there on your desk. Oh, uh, no, this one's not very good. I don't like the color. Well, I'm afraid they're all standard brown flower pots. Yeah, but this one's faded. Can I get a newer one? I suppose I don't see why not. He hands you a slightly newer looking pot. Oh, wait. Actually, though, I guess the old pot has more experience, so it'll grow plants better. Can I have that one back? Certainly. You do need to make sure you have the best pot. Best pot, best plants, best ingredients. Although... Elvis, just take a pot. Okay, fine. I take a pot. Grand. Wonderful. And now, I've got something special. A bag full of soil. Everyone form a line and we'll get you soil. Everybody forms a line and Fickletick scoops little spades full of soil into everyone's pot, one at a time. Until finally, everyone has soil. Then he pulls out a bag of seeds. Now for the most important part, your seeds. Now this is actually just a common lavender seed. We won't begin with anything fancy, of course. You have to crawl before you can walk. But did you know, lavender deters garden pests? That's right. Now, I'll go around and give everyone a seed, which you should plant about a fingernail's depth into the soil. He traverses the room, handing out seeds, which everyone plants. Now, did everyone get a seed? I raise my hand. Elvis, did you not get a seed? I did, but I noticed the seed wasn't lavender, sir. Not lavender? Well, what kind of seed did you get? I mean, it's the wrong color, sir. This is more like a black. Oh, <laughs> oh, oh, you're a very funny one, Elvis. <laughs> oh, uh, the lavender seed isn't lavender. Ah, uh, to think. What a funny world we live in. Oh, my. Now, that's real observational comedy right there. Would you like to hear something funny I thought of? All the other students are practically squirming in their seats from the sheer boredom right now. Tell us, sir. Is it that you can't drink through a strawberry? Can't drink through... <laughs> a strawberry! You can't drink through it! Oh, oh, oh my. Oh, we have quite the joke teller in class today, everyone. Oh. Oh, you may have been thinking of that one for ages, Mr. Elvis. What's your joke, sir? Ah, yes. Why do they call it a sunflower? If it doesn't provide heat. (laughs) Oh, 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 my. Uh, The joyous ignorance of it. Uh, It's because it's brightly colored. Can you imagine, though? Now, where was I? Oh, Oh, yes, we just planted our seeds. Now, normally, we'd want to wait for the next month or so, but uh, school curriculum being what it is, we sadly have to expedite the process. To do so, simply hold your ones and repeat after me. Fiddle-dee-dee! Fiddle-dee-dee! Wonderful job! Now the seed should sprout within about 24 hours. So, now, until the end of class, I'd like everyone to sit quietly and supervise their lavender. I raise my hand. Yes, Elvis. Can I go to the restroom? Of course. But when we're watching the plants, I prefer those kinds of requests be submitted via paperwork. He hands you some forms. Just fill this out and explain why you need to abandon the dear young life in your charge. And once you're ready, you can go. Ah, oh, dang it. I just want to go for a walk. I don't know. Maybe I was going to smoke cigarettes with the ghoul in the bathroom. 
Not because I want to smoke, but just because I feel like it would add a lot of personality to the bathroom ghoul if he wore a leather jacket and smoked cigarettes. Honestly, that sounds awesome. We ought to go back in there with a live goat later on and work on that ghoul's image. The too cool for school ghoul. I bet we can rack up a ton of school points for that. Tumble Dry would love it. Uh, but okay, I fill out the paperwork. All right, by the time you finish, the bell rings. Ah, oh, man. Well, I'll save this for next time. Sorry, but the paperwork can't be backdated. You'll have to start over from scratch next time. Frag. We need to buy a pompadour wig and a switchblade comb. We could put in a jukebox. The man-eating ghoul bathroom is gonna be the place to be. Downright hopping. Forget about the gateway to infinite consequences. Who needs a ring of power? We're gonna have our own forbidden room. With beer and music and malt milkshakes. But first we have to go to Skippy Bottom's class. Oh uh, yeah, I'm really looking forward to that. On we go, Paul. No distractions. On you go. Skippy Bottom's classroom is physically in the deepest parts of the school. You have to travel down to the basement where they normally keep all kinds of truly unspeakable things. Along the way, you pass numerous warded doorways, inside of which you hear terrible groaning and scratching sounds. Rumors that not even Tumble Dry has fun with whatever's down here, and that he doesn't speak about it. It smells of mildew with a slight metallic tinge of blood. Eventually, you arrive at an elevated platform, and once all the students convene on it, it begins to descend. The trip seems to stretch on indefinitely. The walls are composed of oddly smooth stone. Finally, it comes to a stop in a short, nondescript hallway, at the end of which is an unremarkable wooden door. You proceed through it and find yourselves in a somewhat homey classroom with modest but tasteful wooden desks and furniture. It reminds you a bit of an office. It has that certain air of dignity. The dreadlitch Skippy Bottom warps into existence at the front of the class. It's as though light simply bends around the space, and without a sound, there he is. He may have always been there, you have no idea what kind of spell this is. He says, Let us begin. Take your seats. In the future, I will expect you to make yourselves seated before I begin speaking. I will not take questions during lecture. When I am ready for questions, I will make you be aware. I raise my hand. He pauses for only just a second, then waves his hand. Detention. Fifteen minutes of eternity. Elvis, you find yourself frozen in place. Frozen in a powerful magic field. Your senses stretch out on for eons. Minutes become hours, then days, then weeks. As years pass from your perspective, you begin to realize the exact absurd nature of eternity. It's infinity. It goes on forever. And though you aren't exactly suffering, the absolute gravity of time still weighs on you. If a bird flew from one end of the universe to the other, and each time pecked at a mountain on one end just one time, once that mountain is ground down into dust, your detention still hasn't ended. You have never before felt so small or so finite. Oh, God. Skippy Bottom is God! I am being punished by God! To everyone else, Elvis is just frozen in place with a stupid look on his face and a bunch of distracting runes floating around his head. I have lived for quite some time, and in all my experience, my patience has grown rather long. However, the volume of that patience has remained the same, and it is therefore stretched quite thin. I do not like to repeat myself without reasonable justification. The magic I teach you shall require attention and discipline. You shall receive more personalized instruction as you practice on your own. To begin, I feel it is worth iteration that mountain trolls live nearby and sometimes come down from the mountains in the winter months when food has grown scarce. They will lie in wait and ambush children who find themselves out after curfew. So before that time arrives, I will teach you a practical means of addressing the situation that you will find widely applicable to the threats of concern. Providing himself for demonstration is our very own Elvis. A simple warding seal can be an incredibly powerful method of dealing with any opponent who might otherwise overwhelm you. They prevent most threats from moving or uttering magic, rendering them forced to rely only on their ability to tap deep within themselves to escape. Unlike the method of trading blows or disarming weapons, wardings can be summoned in a large or small radius, making them applicable to one or multiple foes and may be used to capture a foe who is more nimble than yourself. Of course, I've also prepared a separate example for the next step of self-defense. He waves a hand and a large troll appears trapped in a seal at the head of the classroom. For the sake of demonstration, I've gone out of my way to capture a troll myself. Now the length of time at which a seal may stay operational depends on its strength. Foes with weak minds may therefore be trapped almost indefinitely. Trolls, who fit into the category of weak minds, should be quite safe once you hold them, and you may then seek out a teacher or more experienced student to fortify your wardings and do the rest. 
But in the event that you must dispose of your foe yourself, the simplest is a transportation spell which will move that enemy somewhere far away or fatal. In this case, he waves a hand and a portal to the ocean appears. We dispose of this threat by depositing him in the Pacific Ocean. He'll remain there undisturbed until he breaks the seal, at which point he will drown or be crushed by the sheer weight of the waters. Once you develop significant powers, you may one day be able to send your opponents even further, such as space or perhaps the surface of the sun. The important thing is, they are no longer of your concern. And Skippy Bottom releases the troll into the ocean. Now, I will take questions. Cautiously raise my hand. Mason Nostalgia Bottom. Sir, uh, what if you seal away something dangerous, but then somebody unburies it or pulls it out of the ocean, you know? A reasonable question. Over a lengthy imprisonment, most minds give up, go mad and few enemies have allies capable of traversing the Mariana Trench. But I will confess that in my younger years, I have sealed away things beneath the earth or in the ocean which may retain their faculties and remember their grudges, should they ever awake. But I was strong enough to seal them away then, and I've only grown in power since. You see, it gave me time that they haven't. Furthermore, their slumber has not slit my mind. In my case, I'm rather curious to see what they'd say once they see how things have developed, but if you are especially worried, the time your warding will buy you may give you time to double back and clean up after your messes if you feel the caution is warranted. Any further questions? I want to say something dumb, but if Elvis is just the warning shot, I am afraid what happens next. Everyone else is thinking the same thing. So Skippy Bottom goes on to explain the basics of warding and transportation spells. It's technically complicated, but sort of easy to execute. Like if you trained yourself enough, you could do it on autopilot which you figure is kind of the point. Nobody masters anything on the first day, but Skippy Bottom goes around personally critiquing everyone's form. Elvis, you snap out of your eternity punishment after being trapped for 15 minutes, and the whole thing feels like a strange, distant dream now. I have lived a million lifetimes. Guys, I have seen the face of God and he is a skeleton! You know, the devil was an agent of God. There's probably some overlap in the sheer enormity of terror that he could bring into your life. I don't know. I had all the time in the world to think, but no answers. I just know he's a higher power, and I need to become like him. Sadistic and scary? No! A powerful skeleton! You already are a skeleton. Just with meat and guts and stuff. I need to shed all that. That's just- that's just holding me back. This can't be my form anymore. I must become skeleton. I thought I knew what wealth was before, but now our, our, there's a there's a limit to my money! A billion gold coins? A trillion? It's nothing! Just a speck! What Skippy Bottom has, that's- that's in- that's the only substantial thing in the world! It's the only thing that's real! Okay, Elvis. I think being trapped for all eternity for 15 minutes has made you just a little loopy. I'm still trapped in that seal, Mason! I never got out! I don't even know how I'm talking to you! It's endless! It never ended! It, it, time starts and it ends in Japan and it travels in a loop! And soon, almost like an eye blink, I'm gonna be trapped in that seal again! It's my place forever! It's where I always am! Skippy Bottom's power is my only way out of there! What if Skippy Bottom just made you think you were trapped for all eternity? What? No, no, you don't understand. I was really there. That implies that Skippy Bottom has infinite power. But you know how Mason can trap you in your happiest memory? Well, what if Skippy Bottom just creates a memory of eternity, you know, like a feeling of it, and he puts that in your head? But... that... that... he, he can't... But Lowry, it felt so real! Yeah, that's how that magic works. Oh. You're probably not really trapped in there. It's just that your brain's broken forever. Oh. Yeah. Well, Skippy Bottom is still pretty darn cool. That is still a pretty cool trick. Either way, real time is passing now, and class is over before you know it without any further intermittent shenanigans. It's the fear, really. On the way back up the elevator, those kids that you met earlier, Robert, Donald, and Zell Fairplus, are talking to each other. Donald says, That Skippy Bottom is even scarier up close. I sure wouldn't want to get on his bad side. Zell Fairplus replies, Of course, he's one of the most dangerous Dark Lords ever to live. It's only a shame that he retired, but it's for the best. Donald says, what do you mean it's a shame? She says, well, it's just a waste of potential, that's all. There's still so much that he could teach us. He's literally a teacher. Excuse me, nobody asked you, and I meant in terms of governing people. Maybe he finds that kind of thing tedious? No, Lowry. Zelferpolis is right. 
We should build a statue of Skippy Bottom and worship it, but somewhere where it won't bother him. I can write a book about what I think he'd want us to do, and then if he doesn't smite us, it means that I got it right. Or it means he doesn't care, Elvis. Even his indifference would be a form of divine inspiration, Robert says. I still don't think he's that tough. What's he gonna do? Kill me? Been there, done that. I'll come right back and testify against him, too. I'm not afraid. We just had an entire class about what he'd do. And I think if Skippy Bottom cared, he'd do a lot worse than what that Huglack guy is capable of. Zelferopoulos says, I don't know about that. And besides, Mason, would you please stop saying the Dark Lord's name out loud? He finds it very annoying. I'm sure he's got better things to do than worry about punishing some 12-year-old for being uppity. Like, for example, torturing Robert here. He surely does. But he's far more present than you're giving him credit for, and if you're not careful, you're going to wind up on a very dangerous list. He's killed people less important than you with fewer casual thoughts about it. Jeez, why do you care so much about Lord Huglack? What is he, your boyfriend or something? He is not my boyfriend. He's a powerful Dark Lord who deserves to be respected, and you should stop using his name before the consequences rightfully land. Fine. I didn't realize you were so uppity about the natural order. Well, it's important to remember our places in wizard society. And beneath the Dark Lord is where most of us fall. She probably does have sexy posters of him. I'm not talking to you anymore. You don't have to be embarrassed. I have the summer swimsuit poster up in my room. Sometimes when I need motivation to do exercise, I just look at it and I think, body goals. Oh, you have the Sins in the Sand shoot? Yeah, I really think it's his best one. I rather prefer his autumn shoot. You know, Ursipper in office? The suit's dignified and tasteful, but still sexy, and the smoldering way he looks at the camera? Oh, just absolute passion. I won't deny that he looks good, but you really can't pull that look off without a personal tailor and a fortune in designer clothing. Definitely, though, if I ever make it, that's gonna be how I dress. Well, if you come by my house at the end of the school year, I got like two or three personal tailors I'm not using right now. You can just have mine. Robert cuts in. Well, this is all a lot of information to take in that should really make me question my friendship to Zelferpolis. And maybe even worry about my personal safety. But to be honest, I wouldn't be where I am today if I thought like that. So let's talk about something cool. Griffins. Man, Robert, that, that really... You really suck. Yeah, we were having a pleasant conversation about how much we like that guy that killed you, and who's probably going to kill you again. Not everything has to be about you, Robert. No, listen, see, you guys are probably all familiar with Snargball. You know, everyone plays rugby, but overhead, two guys fight to the death while riding griffins, and whichever griffin rider defeats the other one wins the whole game. Yes, everyone is familiar with Snargball. It's the most popular sport in the entire nation, Robert. Well, I had a friend whose parents wouldn't let him watch Snargball. How am I supposed to know? Anyway, point is, they have griffin stables here at Dorp Toads, and I'm going to ride a griffin, even though we're not allowed. But you're not allowed. The elevator comes to a stop and Robert hops off. I don't care. I'm going to go and have a great big griffin adventure right now. Then he runs off and his friends Zelferpolis and Donald chase after. Oh no. Oh, it's happening. Someone's doing the thing. I was having a lovely conversation and making a new friend. This griffin thing has ruined everything. I hate that kid. We have to tell a teacher. I absolutely agree, Elvis. It's time to tattle. There's only one place to go. The Trial of Office Hours. The Trial of Office Hours, Paul. Indeed. To see any of the teachers at Dorp Toads, you have to visit them at their office. Their doors are always open at any time, but first you have to complete a life-threatening gauntlet proving that you're worthy of your professor's attention. I'd be willing to tolerate that in exchange for round-the-clock office hours. Paul, for a second I thought the trial of office hours would be that they're magically only available when you have class. If that were the case, why would they even have office hours, Lowry? Because, Elvis, that way they can say it's your fault if you fail an exam. Why didn't you make use of office hours if you needed help? Ah, uh, Tumble Dry would never do that. I'll bet his exams are all deadly hikes through the woods. Or you have to walk through a city park at night and prove you're magical enough to not get mugged. He is weirdly practical and hands-on for how impractical he is. Yeah. You know how in a lot of classes you're learning lessons to pass the exams, but during your career you might not use what you learned? Well, that's all super abstract and easy to lose interest in. But if your teacher is waiting around the corner to beat you up and steal your lunch money, it's only natural instinct to learn self-defense. Or, Elvis, you could become a neurotic mess who chews their fingernails down to the nub and can't sleep at night. 
I guess hands-on education's not for everyone, Lowry. Anyway, I guess we better head down to the teacher offices. Paul, time is of the essence. Robert's gonna have an adventure. I lead us to the trials. Away! Down twisting corridors and across invisible floors, you finally come to a large gateway, near which is a plaque that says, Offices. So all four teachers are behind this door. Beyond the trials, yes. Paul, since I had a brother who went here before me, did he ever mention anything about the trials? Yes, Elvis. Your brother said that few students would ever dare, and some who did never returned. The teachers changed the trials on a regular basis, which is kind of a nuisance for them, so the trials are sort of lazily put together and not always fair. Well, guys... There's students out there about to risk their lives riding a griffin without permission. They may not appreciate it, but we gotta put it all on the line to tell on them. Well, that goes without saying. Can you imagine a Dorp Toads where kids can just do whatever without supervision? I don't know if you guys have seen the dorms, but it's a co-ed situation, and everyone gets just enough privacy to scheme in small groups. It's gonna be nothing but adventures all year if we don't set a precedent now. Actually, Mason, I think maybe Robert and his friends are outside the norm. I was reading an article, and did you know that Dorp Toads has a whopping 15% teen pregnancy rate? That's per year. Well, Lowry, starting a family is also a type of adventure, so we're still on the same track. Maybe dangerous extracurricular activities are a good idea. I bet Self Airplus will be safe from Donald and Robert if they're both in the hospital all the time. Wait, so are we realizing it's safer if we just let Robert get hurt? I'm saying if he's busy doing dumb stuff... He'll never have enough time to do other types of dumb stuff. Man, how does anyone even wrangle a school full of magic teenagers? I heard a story about two kids who got a hold of a blanket that turned them invisible. Eventually they got so brazen that Skippy Bottom caught them in the middle of the cafeteria. I don't even begin to understand what would make someone take that sort of risk. Me either, Lowry. We're obviously a different cut. We're the kids who are never going to get caught doing the hanky-pank no matter how many secret labyrinths or invisibility spells or whatever else we find. Mason, I don't know if I want to commit to that, you know, proclamation. Fight your natural urges, Elvis. You tattling is all that prevents that type of thing, and it has to be us that's doing it. Besides, I don't think your prospects are all that good. Well, excuse you, Lowry. We're currently only 12, and if I don't grow into beauty, I am neither too desperate nor too proud. And I am confident enough to say that I will hook up with someone eventually. Therefore, I will. However homely or unattractive my lady of choice may be. Don't you want to be a skeleton? You won't even have, like, organs. Skeletons can bone. Well, if we're going to start keeping track of that type of thing, I saw some kids making out in the hall on the way here, so we're going to need a notebook to keep track of it or something. Oh, and uh, Tumble Dry made out with a hat rack. Yeah, I guess we better tattle on him, too. Okay, so we're going to go in there, we're going to do the trials. And then just tell on as many people as we can think of. But guys, if we're the kiss tattlers, that's going to be our reputation. And everyone will remember that, including the girls. We're never going to get away with kissing anyone ourselves. We'll buy an invisibility blanket and play it smarter than the other kids. This is war and politics, Elvis. Take your gloves off and don't hold your punches. <sighs> okay. All right, Paul, I guess we go through the door. Now mindful not to touch any exposed surfaces in the school, you turn the doorknob with a sleeve and walk inside. The door closes behind you, and you find yourself in a pavilion of sorts. Wait, does the door lock? No, no, no. In fact, there's a sign posted right where you walk in that says, Consider leaving. We're very busy. If you have an appointment, please proceed to the right. To your right seems to be a brick wall. To your left, you see three reanimated zombies standing around doing nothing in particular. There's also a moat, and the current seems to be moving very fast. There's a small rowboat tied to the shore that you guys are on, and on the opposite side is another door. I get my wand at the ready. If one of those zombies does anything funny, I'm throwing him right in the moat. One of the zombies starts waving and walking towards you. Into the moat! Hey guys, I'm- ah! The current carries him away into an opening at the far side of the room. He then reappears again at the near side of the room. Ah oh man, what did I even do this time? He struggles and thrashes against the current. What the heck, Elvis? He wasn't even doing anything. The dead are not meant to walk, that is automatic funny business. Well, that one's smart enough to talk to us on top of everything else. <laughs> oh god, somebody help me! That says to me that he's more dangerous. An undead who craves to eat my flesh, but can also trick us into a false sense of confidence? Completely insidious. Okay, alright, I guess that's a good point. We don't really know their motives. Presumably to test us somehow. To see if we're dumb enough to be eaten by zombies, and I'm not gonna fall for it. I can't drown, but this is really stressful! Aren't there two other zombies? What are they doing? Just watching you guys. There's a man and a woman. Do you guys talk? The lady says... Not if you're going to throw us in the river. Into the river! Splish! 
She goes in the river. There's now two zombies struggling in vain to escape the current. <laughs> Why? I didn't even do anything. As far as we know! Well, I hope the answer to this particular trial is to throw all the zombies in the moat, or else we're failing spectacularly. If Tumble Dry set this up, I wouldn't be surprised if this is the right answer. I feel like he's all about self-determination. Yeah, but he probably also believes in friendships and things being more than they seem. But if the zombies were going to trick us, then that is them being more than they seem. I guess that's good enough logic. Paul, throw the third zombie in the water. Oh, please! No! Oh! Splash! Now all the zombies are suffering and struggling against the current. Doesn't this seem, like, a little too easy? Well, if the point was that they're gonna trick us, us being too dumb to be tricked makes it really easy. I guess I can't really argue with that. But so how are we supposed to cross the moat now? The zombies are gonna grab the boat and try to capsize it. We don't need it. I can levitate things and so can Elvis. We'll just levitate each other across the moat. Okay, Paul, we do that. Will you guys levitate yourselves over the struggling zombies and the rushing water, and then... Ah, uh, here it comes. You're on the other side of the moat. Oh. Yeah, I really expected that to go wrong. And yet it did not, and here you are. Okay, go over to the door. Can I open it? The door is locked with what appears to be three conventional locks. So, what, they need a key? So it would seem. Hang on, I've got something for this. Hello, Vera. And Paul, the locks just magically come undone. The locks unlatch. You open the door and it reveals a gradually curving hallway, which gently curves out of sight. Okay. No, this is too easy. There's obviously another door or something. I'm sure that it didn't turn out we guessed exactly the right answer without even interacting with the trial. I guess if you want to interrogate the zombies, my telekinesis is strong enough I can twist their arms around and stuff. That would make me feel a lot better. Okay, Paul, I grab one of the zombies and lift him into the air. You better start talking, you beef jerky trash! Uh, 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 okay, on the one hand, thanks for getting me out of that. On the other, harsh. And also, you put me in that. You know, you don't see me making fun of your watery aliveness. Oh, you're right. That's sorry, I was. No, wait, I mean, shut up, please. It's fine, Elvis. I'll do it. Listen up, you beef jerky trash. You're gonna shut up and answer our questions. Uh, okay. Did I not just tell you to shut up? Elvis, did I not just tell him to shut up? Well, I was more polite about it, but yes, we did. Well, I'm not gonna be polite. I got a reputation to uphold with this guy. Elvis, twist his arm clean off. <laughs> okay. Uh, Paul, I guess I just twist that zombie's arm right off. You tear his arm off like a chicken drumstick. Ah, oh, hey, man. Not cool. I mean, I can't feel it, but still. Gotta use my arm for stuff. You'll get it back when we get some information. And only if I like the answers. Man, you are some dead, cold 12-year-olds. I'm just now getting into my edgy phase. My parents don't understand me and I'm mad about it. Well, that's just great. What's the objective of this puzzle? Don't jerk me around, you jerky. To go through the door. You already succeeded. What? Well, then why is there a moat? It's a trial. There's like a riddle. I was going to tell you the three of us have keys and only we can open the door if we work together. But I'm mad at the other guy because the girl wants to date him. The girl hates me because she thinks I'm creepy and weird. And the guy thinks that I'm cool and he looks up to me. That doesn't explain why there's a moat. No, I get it. You have to get them to the other side. But they won't ride in the boat with each other. It's based on that riddle where there's like a wolf, a goat, and a watermelon. I think it's a fern plant. Some kind of plant. I don't know why the guy has these things. But we opened the door without you. Right, that's the trial. You passed the test. But what does that have to do with a goat eating a watermelon? It doesn't. I mean, it kind of does. The, the point is, people tend to get caught up in problems trying to solve them the way that they've been presented. Sometimes they call it a false dilemma. Professor Skippy Bottom doesn't like it when students come to pester him with problems that they just can't see their way around, so this is the first part of his trial. Uh, I wonder if that's counterproductive. Because I feel like it would help if someone was there to try to help you think outside the box. Look, kid, I didn't design the test. Skippy Bottom simply explained the loose takeaway, and, and they change these things up every couple of weeks, so I can't even guarantee it's a lesson he's taking very seriously. Alright, well, I kind of like that answer, but not very much. Elvis, slap him around with his own hand a little, but not too hard because he seems helpful. Paul, I guess I slap him around, but not like I mean it. This is just humiliating, okay? I can't even feel this. Oh, you have yet to suffer embarrassment. Stick around us for very long and you will be exposed to many more humiliating things. We'll force you to write poetry and then read it out loud. I've, I've done it to people before. And I'm not sure I totally trust you on account of you being a flesh-eating abomination. Oh, come on. Now you're just being racist. Am I? Is zombie a race, Paul? No, but you could consider it a discriminated class. They usually don't have autonomous free will, so nobody takes it very seriously. Okay, well, you're just a cheap apartment for worms, zombie guy. 
No, I don't care about your feelings, and I don't have to. Mason, that could be somebody's grandmother. It's a guy. And we don't even know if he has kids. Do you have kids, zombie guy? Not me. I said he could be someone's grandmother. He signs up for an adoption, he gets a gender change, and, and we don't know, Mason, he could be anything. You need to learn to see non-living people as an infinite horizon. Lowry, you don't even respect people on that level. That's not true. I just wish everyone were dead. Well, regardless, I'm not going down that hallway sight unseen. Elvis, can you hold that zombie out in front of us so if something shoots a fireball at us or like a trap flies out, it'll hit this guy instead? I guess I don't see why not. Paul, I levitate the zombie on into the hallway. Does anything happen? Seems safe. At least for the zombie. Lead on, Elvis. Forward, march! You head on. The hallway doesn't go for very far before you find another door. You open it, using your zombie hostage as a shield, of course, and find what appears to be a lovely outdoor dinner party attended by a crowd of well-dressed zombies. The place is friendly and warmly lit by magical floating fires which are safely elevated above you. Mason, I can't grab all these guys. Zombie hostage. Explain all this. Elvis, hit him with his own hand for incentive. Oh, for goodness sake, it's not even a secret. I'm, I'll just tell you. That's exactly what you'd say if it were a secret and you weren't gonna tell us. You guys are crazy. Just talk to that guy. Your hostage points out a thin-looking zombie in a nice suit. His hair is inexpertly slicked down. He looks like he wants to talk to you, but isn't sure how to interrupt. Wait, how do we know this isn't the same lesson as last time? Shouldn't we just move forward without consulting anyone? It's not the same. Well, then that's really bad game design, zomboy. My name is Clyde, and I already told you these things are hashed together once every couple of weeks. The point isn't really to prevent you from seeing a teacher or to destroy you. They're just meant to be a hassle, and sometimes they will destroy you. Well, I want to submit a complaint. Good game design involves introducing a concept, then you add a twist to that concept. Like, for example, if we had to twirl a baton to get through the last room, in this room it should still be baton twirling, but then we apply a new move that we haven't learned before. It's still zombies. I don't think you understand the difference between a theme and a puzzle. How many people is this? Do we even want to know where Skippy Bottom is getting all these dead bodies from? Order of the Rock. Ah, of course, yes, the Order of the Rock. You say that like you know what it is. I do. It's a famous... church. Boat? Drinking establishment. Every time there's a new Dark Lord besides Skippy Bottom, Tumble Dry assembles a new Order of the Rock. A rock's like a huge bird. Tumble Dry thinks it symbolizes strength and resilience. Anyway, the casualties are usually through the roof, but when you sign on for the Order of the Rock, you're on for life and beyond. Most people think that's just figurative, but here those people are. Wait, if Tumble Dry has an undead army, why doesn't he send them to fight the Dark Lords? He says making us fight is disrespectful to our memories. Well, could they make ghosts? Yeah, but ghosts look exactly like their past selves. And Tumble Dry says if we rely on them too much, the longing to reunite with our loved ones will drive us mad. Really? I have a step-grandma from my grandpa's second marriage who haunts one of our bedrooms, and I just wish she'd go away. She keeps wailing all night about stains on the sofa. You tell me this stuff like I know what I'm talking about and can debate with you about it. I'm just repeating what I'm told. I think you guys ought to be used to fight. You've already died for your cause. Seems unethical to let your descendants bite it too. I mean, they can still be killed, but you already have that taken care of. I kind of agree. But also, I wouldn't want to get trapped in one of Skippy Bottom's seals, so I don't argue with the guy. Now look, this poor sap has been waiting all week to tell someone his puzzle. Are you gonna let him? Fine. Tell us the puzzle suit, zombie. Are you sure? Yeah, I wouldn't ask if I wasn't sure. All right, it's just the Order of the Rock's a big deal, and you're talking about making changes. You know, maybe you could bring it up when you go to see the professors. Well, we need to know your puzzle before we can see anyone, suit zombie. My name is Andy. Andy, could you possibly skip ahead and just tell us the answer to the puzzle? No, I'm not allowed to do that. Andy, what'd you do in the Order of the Rock? Well, I was a spy when we were trying to stop Tumble Dry's ex-boyfriend. Clyde interrupts. Zipperbad wasn't Tumble Dry's boyfriend. That's just a stupid rumor. Andy continues. Allegedly, it was a boyfriend, but it was definitely Zipperbad the Star Traveler, and long story short, I got caught. Earlier today, Tumble Dry implied he made out with my grandma. Nobody really knows what's going on with Tumble Dry's head. It's just schemes nested in schemes. I personally think he tries everything at once just to see what he can get away with, and he only throws up a smokescreen of morality so that you think he's operating on a personal code. Andy disagrees. No, that's not true. He's pretty consistent when he puts his foot down on some things. Clyde says, eh, what do you know? What'd you do, Clyde? Me? Uh, sometimes the Order needed stuff, 
so I got things. So you're like a thief? More like smuggler, but I mean sometimes, yeah. I didn't know you were an important person, Clyde. Is it okay your arm came off, or...? Eh, Skippy Bottom will put it back on later, don't worry about it. This seems really unfair. I slapped you with your own hand. This is no way to make use of the unliving corpse of a war hero. Well, I broke a lot of laws. So if the wizard police caught me, the standard procedure is to open a pit directly to hell and toss me in. Oh. Yeah, and there's no trials, so this is annoying, but it's better than that. Has there ever been a Dark Lord that tried to destroy just all of wizard society? Yeah, tons of them. And some of them have written some really moving books about it. I mean, I get it. I kind of I kind of see. This is really interesting, but Robert is probably going to be riding that griffin any second, and we need to get moving. He's still got to navigate out of Dorp Toads, and without a guide, that might take a while. Then I'm sure he can't just walk up and hop right on a griffin as soon as he gets there. I bet we got at least 40 minutes, maybe an hour. Still, though. All right, Andy, puzzle. Okay, you see that lady over there? He points to a zombie in an evening dress. I really want to dance with her, but I'm afraid to ask. That's the puzzle? I hook you up with some zombie tart and we move along? That's how it is, yeah. Do you even like that girl for real, Andy? Yeah, but she's a little out of my league and we don't have a lot in common. Oh my god. Lowry, see if there's another door that we can just walk through. Alright, I scout around. You find another door, but this one appears to be shut behind a magic seal rather than a conventional lock. Oh, imagine my tremendous surprise that my unlock all doors power doesn't unlock all the doors. Hey lady! Yes, you! You want to dance with Andy? The zombie lady looks over and says, What? Are you talking to me? Yeah, come dance with Andy. I suppose that would be okay, but I'd rather he ask me himself. Okay, Andy, go. Oh, I can't. I'm embarrassed. Dude, what are you doing to me? None of this is real. Just go dance with the lady. She said it's fine. I know it isn't real, but my job is to be reluctant and tell you that I'm shy. Really? Clyde, what's up with this? What is the point of this? Skippy Bottom is just trying to show you how annoying it is to solve problems that aren't really problems. Okay, so we gotta hook you up with this girl, and she's willing, but Andy just isn't, and the point of this is to frustrate us. Hang on, I've got an idea. Paul, I walk up to the lady. Hey, zombabe. Do you want to date a guy with confidence? I'm that guy. Say you're mine, and I'll stop saying pickup lines. Wow, she says, rolling her eyes. I love a man with confidence. I guess I will date you. Okay, see, now this girl's no longer on the table as a problem or anything, because now she's not available to you. Well, if I were really invested in how all this turns out, I'd take some umbrage with this solution. But since I don't really care, I guess I can see the justification for it. Man, Elvis, you are just all over weird wizard psychology. I guess it's just who I was born to be, Mason. Andy shuffles over to the door, touches the seal, and it fades away, revealing the next hallway beyond. How long does the Trial of Zombies go, Paul? Because apparently both the last ones were made by Skippy Bottom, and I was expecting one per teacher. They go as long as the teacher decides, Elvis. The Trial of Office Hours makes no promises, least of all of safety or timeliness, and on days when professors are too busy, they've been known to make the trials impossible. Like, deceptively impossible? Paul, are we going to waste our entire day trying to tattle and not get to the end? I wouldn't do that to you, Mason. We've only got one day for these games, and I wouldn't mess with you like that. At least not very often. Yes, Lowry, at least I wouldn't do it very often anyway. Let's be real, Paul. It's not like you don't sometimes create seemingly impossible situations just to see how we'll get around it. You know, it's funny you should bring that up, because you guys advance through the next doors and find yourself in a sort of forest grotto. There's a well-cultivated garden here, a variety of attractive plants and flowers, and trees of numerous species. On one of the trees, there's a plaque that says, Anything worth doing is worth waiting for. That seems like a generalization that's patently false in a lot of situations. Yeah, like what if you have to go to the bathroom? Fickletick made you fill out a bunch of forms for that, remember? This is obviously Fickletick's room. Oh yeah, he did do that. Alright, everybody fan out. Look for any hints what we're supposed to do. Especially look for shortcuts and cheats, because I get the feeling that doing things the right way is going to waste all our time. A fan out! Start feeling for hidden doors along the walls. Elvis and Mason, what are you guys looking for in particular? Check around every tree and bush to see if maybe there's some instruction manuals, or like some levers, or anything we can work with, I guess? And I guess flip that plaque over to see if there's anything written on the back of it. Of course, the old trick where you write a puzzle on the back of a sign and then nail it to a tree so nobody can read it. Only the most clever wizards may pass. More like most destructive. 
A clever wizard tears down every wall between him and his objective. Then there's no more walls. Mason, some of these walls might be load-bearing. Okay, well then maybe we leave some of the walls up. Well, Larry checks the walls, and you're not sure if they're structurally important, nor do you see any hidden doors or notice any conspicuous seams. Elvis pokes around, and aside from a few brightly colored magic garden slugs, finds nothing of note. Mason, you pry the plaque off the tree through a considerable amount of tugging and pulling, only to find there's nothing written on the backside. Aw, and I work so hard and patiently at it, too. I put a garden slug in my empty chocolate millipede box. Now you have a blue and yellow friend. Oh, speaking of, are you still holding Clyde hostage? I like Clyde and now have a newfound respect for him. So yes, he's my forever hostage until Stockholm Syndrome makes us best friends for life and until thereafter. The fate of many of our NPCs. Clyde says, yeah, this is usually where students give up. Why's that, Clyde? Because this trial is just completely unfair. There's no way you can be wrong if you wait long enough, but nobody has that kind of time and Fickletick probably thinks he's being clever when he really isn't. I don't suppose you could tell us the answer? Nope, can't do it. We don't even have anything to work with. It's just a garden. Well, maybe you can tell us what the puzzle is? Sorta. Look, when students get frustrated with the fickle tick puzzle, and they're all frustrating, me and the other zombies like to poke our heads in and offer hints. You know, it's the only way anyone gets through it. Fickle tick is just really bad at these things. Okay, well then give us a hint, because we are on the clock and we have no ideas. Does it involve the slugs? I can't confirm or deny it has to do with the slugs, but I can start with something simple. What happens to anything if you wait long enough? Everything that can go wrong, does go wrong. Sure, and then after that? My dad hires a lawyer. Okay. And he uses lawyer wizard magic to make all the problems settle out of court. Yeah, okay, but let's go further. What happens after that? Wait, is this puzzle going to take longer than it takes to settle a lawsuit? It can take years to settle a lawsuit. We'll graduate. I am well aware. And many years after that, we'll all be blank. A powerful lich to rival Skippy Bottom. Obviously we can't all be that, or else there would have been one other wizard who ever was that. Skippy Bottom was the first and made it his business to be the last. Don't get your hopes up. Oh, okay then. Well, many years after we graduate, we'll all be disappointed. I'm disappointed now. This puzzle sucks. Uh, And then what happens after all the disappointment and old age and all the rest of that stuff? Heat death of the universe. We need to freeze the room. Okay, way too far. All right, back up to at least within the planet's lifespan. The sun expands into a red giant and engulfs the earth. We have to set the room on fire. Clyde kind of hangs there, like he's trying to think of what to say to that. Wait, am I onto something? Hang on, does anyone know how to make fire? No. No. Darn. I can't believe no one thought of that. Any magic we want, nobody can make a fire. It seemed too obvious. Listen, guys, just just fill in the blank. Okay, if you wait long enough, we'll all be blank. Zombies. <sighs> We're not all going to be zombies. Back up a step before zombies. Okay, dead. But just so you know that even as a zombie, you're still dead. So the room needs death to let us pass through? Again, can't give you the answer, but if you wait long enough, every living thing in this room would be dead. So we need to offer a human sacrifice. I knew this would happen eventually, I just thought this was senior year stuff. Okay. I'm kidding, Clyde. But killing all this stuff is going to be a lot of work. Lowry and Elvis, can you guys use your levitato to yank up the trees? Maybe we can start with big stuff and gradually work our way down. It's like 50 strength, I think that's enough for a tree. Okay, start with this one that has the plaque on it, and then use that to beat the other trees to death. Show Fickle Tick what we think about waiting. Alright, Paul. Lowry and I work together to yank up a tree and toss it into another tree. All right, that makes your work easy, because the minute you tear that tree up from the ground, you find beneath its roots is a tunnel and another doorway. We did it! Thanks, Clyde! Fickletick is such a hack. Who makes a puzzle where the answer is to get mad and flip the game board? We've wasted enough time up here, no time to dwell. On through the next door. You head on through those doors and find yourself in what appears to be a small office lobby. There's a front desk and several comfortable-looking office chairs. Behind the desk is what appears to be a gorgon, with her head covered up by a lampshade. Oh. Uh... Oh, we learned about this. McDougal taught us. Uh, cockatrice doodle doo Presto, I forgot. You're gonna fail her exam. It wasn't even part of her lesson plan! The Gorgon says, Hello, is someone there? Okay, you keep your face where we can't see it. That's why I'm wearing the lampshade. Are you students? I'm Professor McDougal's trial. Her trial is to fill out a questionnaire about your feelings on the previous trials. She'd like you to emphasize in particular if at any time you felt frightened, frustrated, or in danger. The questionnaires are anonymous. 
Oh, is that it? That's it. That's the whole trial. Does Clyde have to fill one out? Who's Clyde? Clyde says, I'll fill one out. Levitato a clipboard to Clyde. Does my pet slug have to fill one out? I don't think it does. Is there rooms for write-ins? Because I have a lot of feelings about this particular trial, and I'm going to write them all. There's space on the bottom. So a Gorgon, huh? Yeah. And Professor McDougal thought you'd be a good receptionist for a trial. Are you always a receptionist, or do you ever do other stuff? A lot of McDougal's trials are like this. She once set up a triple blind where students didn't know what we were testing, and I didn't know what we were testing, and I also couldn't see the results and report on them. I don't know if it went well. How's a Gorgon get a job like this? Uh, I used to be night security down in the dungeons. A lot of really dangerous things can be stopped by turning them to stone. Most things that get loose ought to be stopped on sight too, so it's win-win, and I thought I was doing good. But I got one too many students. They kept coming down there to make out and do other gross things. In the dungeons? But it's cold and damp, and I think there's a portal to some weird dimension whispering secrets I can't understand. They keep saying to get closer, but my brother told me if you follow them all the way, it's just a big scream at the end. Yeah, I miss the old muttering portal of baited doom. My name's Phaedra, by the way. I feel like it's not fair you lost your job just because some kids were being careless. We have deaths and casualties all the time. In fact, right now there's a kid who's going to ride a griffin without proper training or supervision. Our progress is really slow, though, so he's probably going to die. It's not like I don't feel bad about it. You set out to protect kids and you feel good about that, but then it turns out you're a liability. McDougal is my boss, so she went to tumble dry about it and... He thought it wasn't my fault either, so he asked McDougal to come up with a compromise where no one loses. So here I am in the trial of office hours. Not that I'm complaining. It beats being homeless. Yeah, with questions like these, I guess she's trying to still use you to save lives. And a complete disregard for my autonomy. At least the other professors are attempting a puzzle. This is a complete travesty of the puzzling profession. Actually, I don't see any choices to report on this trial. If this trial is scaring you, you can say so in the comment section. I was thinking more like, why can't this be a jazz lounge? Or like a poetry club, and we write poems about how we feel, and then we get to advance if the poem's good. Don't listen to that. It always turns out terrible. Poetry is not a good idea. I've seen people die. I'm writing that down, in fact. Don't listen to Elvis. Never do a poetry club. I hope that in the future, you will be willing to put up a challenge and threaten my life like a real wizard professor. I did not come to this school to be treated like a child, and I will be writing a letter to whoever or whatever is my government. And done. Tell McDougal to feel ashamed. I'm trying to save a child's life. The least you could do is try to create some drama to underscore the tension. This is amateur hour. Turn mine into. As long as we don't write poetry, I'm happy. I'm also going to recommend dividers so people can't read what I'm writing. You were saying it out loud. And also mandatory earplugs. Clyde Hans is in. I just recommended having it be broadcast if this is a fighting situation. Because I'll tell you, I felt very stressed today. We could work on that. Phaedra says, Oh, I can relate to that. I've been surprised hitting the head an awful lot since getting this job. The door head swings open and leads to a hallway with another set of doors at the end. Once you enter the hallway, the door swings shut and latch behind you. Ugh, man, I let my guard down. Dang it. Frickin' always put a cinder block in the doorways of mysterious dungeons. This always happens. Well, you know how these things go. Nowhere but forward. Just puts us on deadly ground. Now we have to fight like crazy or die. So stupid. Give us the chance to run and we will. On you press through another set of doors which leads into an arena. A solitary suit of armor stands rigidly in the center of the room. What ho! Students come to take a test of valor. I am the final step of your trials. There's a variety of weapons on racks along the wall. Maces, axes, swords, spears, all melee options. No slings or crossbows or anything. Select your weapon and we shall begin our duel. Do we have to? I'm not much of a fighter. I'm 12. Well, you don't have to choose a weapon, no. I always respect an opponent who fights with his bare hands. If such is your choice, then have at. I mean, do we have to fight at all? I'm afraid fighting is all that I know, so if there's another way through, I don't know it. All right. Lowry, Elvis, pin him down. But then I have to set Clyde down. But, just set him down over there. Yeah, I'm not going anywhere. Okay, set Clyde down and levitato! Levitato. You guys hit him with the spell, but the magic simply slides off him. A noble attempt, but now it's my turn. And I'll start with the big one! 
He runs towards you guys, flicking his sword elegantly upward in a slicing motion and cuts Clyde from crotch to sternum. Clyde falls to the ground. Oh man, I'm, I'm not even one of the contenders. I was kidnapped from another trial. Oh, my mistake, terribly sorry. Jeez, you're really gonna kill us. Of course, there'd be no stakes otherwise. Elvis, he turns and grabs you by the throat, squeezing tightly as he does so. Take eight stun, three body. He pulls the sword back. This next part is going to be painful, but quick. Uh, uh, <coughs> uh, Paul, I pull out that box and I dump the slug down this guy's visor. All right, that's a hit. You pull open the visor and see there's nothing there. He's an empty suit of magical armor. And you dump that slug right down into him. Oh, oh, gross. Oh, oh, that does not belong in there. He drops you. Mason, you're up. Scramble away and hit him with the ultimate nostalgia beam. Just as with the levitato, the spell slides right off. Oh, come on. Immune to magic? Really? It's all we know. Larry. Levitato Elvis safely to the other side of the arena. All right, you grab Elvis and fling him to the other side of the arena. Elvis, you roll across the dirt floor, kicking up dust until you come to a stop. <laughs> Thanks, Larry. Don't mention it. The suit of armor finds the slug and fishes it out of himself, then crushes it in his hand. Right. Well, that's one kill, technically. He turns to you, Lowry. Defend yourself! He lunges, once again sweeping from crotch to sternum. Before I tell you the damage, do you have any way of saving yourself? I do have a healing spell. If you let me abort my turn to heal myself right as I take the damage, I might live. I'll allow it. Oh god, not the danglies. Innervado! I heal eight damage. In a panic, you summon the healing energies, knowing full well the sword is coming. It flies through you like you are made of sponge cake. You'll take 15 body, then heal eight of that. All right, and that's a crouch shot, so I... Oh god, pass out. Larry's down. This armor moves fast. Of course, he's got nothing in him. Elvis, you're up. Uh, Levitato, grab a weapon off the rack and hurl it at the guy. Twong! You grab a mace at random and send it shooting like a star across the arena. It bounces off the armor's chest, severely denting it. The blow so hard you knock him down. Oh, oh, good show. I may be immune to magic, but the weapons can be wielded however you see fit. Mason. Oh, oh no, uh, I leap on top of him. Well, he's lying down, so it's practically a matter of just jumping on him, at which point you slap away fruitlessly with your bare hands against pure iron. Mason, how am I gonna hit him now? You're on top of him. Ah, uh, dang. The armor bucks his hips, throwing you off balance and reverses your position. Now he's straddling you, holding you down. He's going for the stab, but the sword is unwieldy at these close distances and you're thrashing around too much. I surrender, I surrender. That is not an option. Elvis. Pa, grab a spear, try to impale the armor against the wall like a butterfly. In one fluid motion, you pull a spear from the wall and ram it into the armor's back, launching him off a mason and sticking him to the wall, facing away from the both of you. Ah, he says, looking down and gripping the spear. Well, I may be able to escape this given time, but not before I'm pummeled to obliteration. I concede. You just said that wasn't an option. Yes, for you. A magical seal on the door at the opposite end of the arena fades away. I applaud your valiance. Sorry once again for your zombie friend. Clyde stands up, doing his best to hold himself together. Go and slap Lowry awake. Uh, uh, hello? All I remember is a bright light, and then an angel descended with her hand outstretched, and then she kicked me in the jewels. Yeah, that's kind of what happened. We did it, Lowry! We passed the trials! Oh, did we? Thank God. I'm starting to have second thoughts about risking my life for Robert's safety. It's more than that, Lowry. It's about an ideal. Standing up for what's right, or what we believe in, or just for being a little jerk. Paul, we carry on. I need to see a doctor. Through those doors you pass, and once again you find yourself in something of an office environment, with potted plants and a water cooler. There's four doors and a plaque near each door with the name of one of the teachers. One for Tumble Dry, one for McDougal, one for Fickle Tick, and one for Skippy Bottom. It's the moment of truth. Who do you choose? See, there's that false dilemma thing again. Clyde, can you go into Fickle Tick's office and tell him some kid named Robert is going to ride one of the Griffins without supervision? Man, I'm going to be doing paperwork for hours. I know, that's why I'm sending you. Elvis, Tumble Dry likes you the best, so no, go- No, 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 I gotta talk to Skippy Bottom. But he doesn't like you. He doesn't like anyone, it's the same. Fine, suit yourself. Then Lowry, I feel like Tumble Dry doesn't know what to do with your willingness to give up and die. So you tattle to him, and I'll see if I can get something out of McDougal. Will do. Alright team, break. 
Everyone heads through their respective doors. We'll start with Elvis. Elvis, you find yourself in a rather distinguished-looking office with various decorations that likely predate history. Skippy Bottom is writing something, but he pulls his hand away from the quill and it continues writing without him. Come, he says, motioning to the chair across from him. I should hope your visit is worth visiting for. I sit down. Yes, sir. I've come to beg for you to teach me. I am teaching you. I know, sir, but privately. More than the other students. I want to be a lich and do amazing things. You don't realize what you're asking to sacrifice. It's a higher calling than all that I am now, sir. You haven't the stomach to go through with it. You're dismissed. I stand up and I slap Skippy Bottom. You slap Skippy Bottom across his alabaster face. He gazes up at you with his embery eyes in a long, dreadful silence. Finally, he says, You've mistaken my assertion for a test of character. I'll brave and do anything you have to throw at me. You will tolerate me for giving this rash action because it remains between the two of us, and you'll be grateful for the wealth of mercy that I show you now. Act out as such in public, and I will be forced to take severe action. If there's nothing further, then you are dismissed. Well, also, I guess Robert's going to ride a griffin, and someone has to stop him? Then you should have done so directly. If not for the seriousness of your first request, I would be annoyed now. Will that be all? Also, I guess it seems like he's going to go through the portal of infinite consequences. Do you know when? No, sir. Very well. Consider yourself granted an appointment when you know the detail. If that's the last of it, you may see yourself out. He waves open the door you came through, which now leads into the initial hallway where you entered the trial of office hours. Okay. Thank you, I guess. I'll be back. And then I leave. Out the door you go. Mason, you walk into the office of Professor McDougal, which is neat and tidy in every possible respect. She's sitting at attention as though she were expecting you, and she straightens up a stack of papers slightly as she says, Mr. Nostalgia Bottom, please have a seat. She waves her hand, and a seat slides out for you to sit in. Ma'am? I'm so sorry about the trial. I, I feel it's a bit much, and I've been trying to build a case against it, but Skippy Bottom and Tumble Dry are in agreement, and I've had the most difficult time coming up with empirical evidence to show it's not a good idea. That's fine. I had fun. Oh. Yeah, anyway, I came here to warn you that Robert's going to ride a griffin without supervision, and I guess he might be riding it, like, right now, or just finishing up. I don't actually know, but it's wrong and someone had to be told. Oh, goodness. Well, the rules state that all disciplinary action has to be processed through tumble dry, so let's go ahead and make your case. She gets up, flicks her wand, and a door appears in the wall next to you. Lowry! What you enter is a messy office space. There's underwear on the floor, and it looks too big to be tumble dry's. There's a bicycle suspended in midair by magic, and a parakeet cackling aggressively from a cage in the corner. There's a mirror on one of the walls where the Lowry reflected inside is making rude gestures at you. Make a rude gesture right back. Oh, I see you've noticed my mirror of deepest desires, Tumble Dry says. Is that what that is? He's flipping me the bird. Oh yeah, that's what it does most of the time. But every now and then, without warning, it shows you exactly what you want to see, and for the rest of your life you can't look away. I just keep it out in the open and look at it occasionally. To be honest, it's not as powerful as they say it is. They keep showing me all kinds of things, but then I just go outside and get whatever that thing is. Doesn't hold a lot of power if you're a man with material needs. Okay, well, I'm just gonna... Paul, I pick up a paperweight or a stapler or something and just chuck it into the mirror. Crash! The mirror is destroyed and pieces tumble to the floor. Oh, well, I guess that's defeated now. So ends a long and illustrious history of corruption. Now how am I going to know what I want to eat for dinner? Sorry, that guy was pissing me off. A door appears on the wall and McDougal lets herself in. Mason follows right behind her. Oh, speak of the devil, Tumble Dry says. Were you discussing me, McDougal asks. No. Well, I have a student here with concerning news about improper behavior. Are you busy with your own student? It's okay, ma'am. I'm here for the same reason. Oh, well, then go ahead and tell Tumble Dry what I was told. Robert's going to ride a griffin, and he doesn't have permission. Tumble Dry shoots up. Is that so? Well, I'm glad you told me. We can't have kids running around doing things without consequences. He pulls a buck knife out of a drawer and presses it into your hand, Mason. Then he winks. Come on, let's go stop some troublemakers. He flicks his wand and poof! You guys are outside in front of the griffin stables. Before you is a terribly wounded Robert. His friends, Donald and Zelferpolis, are in a panic, standing either side of him, but not sure what to do. It's clear that Robert has been mauled by the griffin, and it looks pretty bad. There might even be some organ damage. The griffin is squawking and scratching at its paddock. Oh, so close. 
Tumble Dry lifts up his robes, then pulls another buck knife out of his drawers. He throws it down next to Robert. All right, so the key to riding a griffin is that you gotta prove you can handle yourself in a deadly fight with a bladed weapon. Only the winner can ride the griffin. Go on, Mason, get him! McDougal grabs Tumble Dry's arm. Sir? Oh, right. I guess I better make this fair. Innervato! Robert's wounds are healed, and he grunts a sigh of relief. All right, now! Student knife fight! Sir, I don't really want to ride the griffin. Oh. Well, Robert can't ride that griffin unless someone's willing to lose a knife fight to him. Donald? Zelfirplus? How about you guys? They shake their heads no. Lowry? I see a chance for no one to get what they want if I don't take action, so I'm not going to take action. Okay, well, I guess the situation is diffused then. Good work, tumble dry, and good work to happenstance. He claps his hands together, and with a mighty explosion, he's gone. Well, Robert, I hope you learned a lesson. And the lesson is that you should have learned Innervato before you came to this school. And also that riding a griffin requires you to knife fight with someone. I'll admit, these are really specific life lessons, but magic changes up a lot of things, so it's it's very delicate, the lessons. Robert and gets up and brushes himself off. He's got blood all down his shirt, but he says, The only thing I've learned is that death is too afraid to come for me. That was a rush, but I need more. I'm going to go through the door of infinite consequences. Ah, oh, man. Could you not? The trial of office hours is like a whole thing, and, and it'll be at least an hour before we can get someone to help you. Well, then don't tattle anymore, Nostalgia Bottom. I'm going to do it, and there's no rational form of argument that could stop me. And with that, he stomps off in the direction of the door of infinite consequences. If you look on the bright side... Robert's going to give us a lot of work to do for a little while, and then all at once, none at all. Well, I guess let's head back to the trials. You guys have no choice but to follow Robert to get back inside, and in the hallway to the dining room, you run into Elvis. Elvis, Robert, and company run past you. Oh, hey, where are you guys going? To the door of infinite consequences, and nobody can stop us. Oh my god, I'm telling. Hey, Elvis, are you ready for round two on the trials? Actually, that sword went just right up in my intestines, and I'm not sure that I got all the internal stuff healed. I still need to see a doctor. Well, we can't just let this run its course. A good tattler never rests, Lowry. Robert's life depends on us being like this. Okay, I've got an idea. What if we apprehend him, then take them in for tattling? Uh, uh, that might be workable. I guess let's give it a shot. Paul, are they through the door already? Nope. You walk into the dining hall, and it appears that Robert is trying to work up the nerve to go in. Pull this. What does that do again? The room is filled with blinding clouds of dust. Okay, Robert shouts, They're trying to stop us! Let's go, quick! You hear footsteps, then a thump, then the sound of a body slapping against the stone floor. When the dust clears, Robert and Donald are nowhere to be seen, and Zelferpolis is lying flat on her back. Ugh, oh, oh, I ran into the door, Frey. Levitato. Well, you're under arrest now. Oh, I most certainly am not. A shadow unravels around Zelferpolis, revealing that all along, she was none other than the Dread Lord Huglack himself. Drop him. Oh, I I'm so sorry, Dark Lord Huglack. I had no idea it was you. Yeah. Your, uh, disguise was really good. Like, top notch. You, you, were, you were in Tumble Dry's class and he didn't even notice. Oh my god, it's the Dark Lord. My dad is your biggest fan. Would you mind signing a few large money bills? It'd make him so happy. Yes, well... That's not exactly the reception I was expecting. Your work is legendary, sir. Uh, I'd really like your autograph, too. Autographs will have to wait. You see, not only have I infiltrated this school, but I received advance word about the Door of Infinite Consequences. And I've devised a method of forcing positive consequences. After you're done killing Robert and stealing that ring or whatever, can you please be one of our teachers? After I receive the consequence I'm seeking, my power will rival even Skippy Bottom. But unlike him, I don't intend to retire. And after a quick wave of his wand, which will supposedly rig the door, he steps inside. Okay, Lowry, I know you're a big fan, but we have got the super tattle on this. No, I know. The Dark Lord is a great man, but he is not allowed. It's not up to me to choose what happens, but it is my place to tell others about it. Well, I have a preset appointment with Skippy Bottom, so let's go. Paul, we rush back to the trial of office hours. You pass through the main doors, and this time, immediately on your right, you see a door that wasn't there before. You go through and find yourselves in Skippy Bottom's office. Professor Skippy Bottom, I want to be a lich! I see you've brought an audience this time. 
Are you tempting fate, or have you come for the clear reason I expressed for you to hold this appointment? The second bit. And also, Lord can't say his name is here, and he just went through the door after Robert did. Ah, uh, good. Skippy Bottom rises, and with a wave of his hand, space bends around you and you're all back in the dining hall. We'll start by sealing the door. Skippy Bottom gestures, and the door is now locked behind a pattern of arcane runes. And step two. A portal to the sun appears. Skippy Bottom simply waves the door into the sun. There we are. The portal closes. Applaud. Uh, Robert and Donald were still in there? I deemed them acceptable casualties. They will be dearly missed. But Lord Huglack said he'd figured out how to rig the consequences. He could be powerful beyond reason now. There were no consequences inside that door. I was the one who leaked, he makes air quotes with his bony fingers, that this year's danger challenge would involve such a powerful artifact. But the truth was, it's a simple stasis trap which Huglack brazenly walked himself into. Oh. And I guess Robert and Donald were cruising for a death sentence anyway. Indeed. Well, sir, this has all been amazing, and you've probably done the world a great service, but so you're aware, I'm telling on you. Go ahead. See if anything can be done about it. It's not about the results, sir. It's about the principle. Paul, I return once again to the trial of office hours. I guess I go too. All right, but after this, I have to see a doctor. Off you go to continue the endless cycle of tattling. Tumble Dry is in fact powerless to do anything about Skippy Bottom, but you impart that knowledge and that's enough for you. With each tattling, I can assume that Elvis once again demands to be a lich. That's right. Well, after a great deal of persistence, one year Skippy Bottom finally gives in, and you begin a dark and terrible path. Mason, you find yourself with many great memorable years behind you, and nothing to look forward to, and this happens every year until you die having lived a fairly fantastic life, which you admit to having but you never properly enjoyed at the time. It's my family code. And finally, Lowry, you see a doctor, and I presume you talk to water at some point. It's actually a spell I bought. I can telepathically communicate with water. I just never saw fit to use it. Well, there it is. A job well done. Everybody did great. Thanks for the game, Paul. I tell you what, Paul. I'll run the next game. I'm thinking about vampires, ruling the streets, political bickering and infighting, all that fun stuff. All right, sounds good. I'll think of a character, and I'll see you guys next week. So that was Everybody's Neville, a tale of adventure to stop other people from having adventure. Coming up next is Vampire the Charade, a story of petulant vampires and the lives that they live. If you guys enjoyed this, and I hope that you do, I've got other stuff that I've worked on over the years. There's tons of things, YouTube, comics, whatever. You can find some of those on donsomewhere.com. That's our website. Again, that's donsomewhere.com. And if you'd like to support me on Patreon, I would really appreciate it. It helps keep me going. I'm on Don Somewhere there as well, so that's Don Somewhere on Patreon. If you join me on there, I try to upload new episodes a week in advance. Anyway, that's all for this arc, so I hope you guys will join me for the next one, and you have a fantastic day.